Picture this, you're out enjoying a sunny day at the park, sitting in a quiet cafe or perhaps you're deep in concentration at work. Everything seems calm, under control, but then, without a warning, your stomach gives out a menacing growl. Panic sets in. You need to find the bathroom and fast. It's a scenario that can disrupt the best of days, turning ordinary moments into a race against time. But what triggers these unexpected urgent bathroom trips? Is it something you ate? A hidden health issue? Or maybe just stress rearing its ugly head? Our bodies are complex systems and sometimes they react in ways that catch us off guard. From the foods we love to the stress we endure, numerous factors can send us scurrying for the nearest restroom. In today's episode, we'll explore these triggers in depth. We'll hear stories from people just like you and me who faced these urgent moments. Their experiences are diverse, but the quest for answers is something we all share. So buckle up as we embark on this journey to unravel the mystery behind emergency poops. Let's meet the first character in today's cast. This is Amy. She loves trying out new recipes. Last night, she experimented with seafood. Unfortunately, the shrimp she used weren't as fresh as she thought. This morning, she's racing to the bathroom every hour. That's food poisoning for you. When harmful bacteria in food wage war on your digestive system, your body's defense is a quick exit strategy. Shortly after her seafood experiment, she felt the first rumblings of discomfort. It wasn't just a regular upset stomach, it was the onset of food poisoning. According to the CDC, one in six Americans get sick from contaminated foods or beverages each year. That's a staggering 48 million people, with seafood often being a common culprit. Amy, like many others, underestimated the risk of using ingredients that weren't as fresh as they should be. What Amy experienced was likely caused by bacteria such as Salmonella or E. coli, notorious for lurking in improperly handled or stored food. These bacteria are like unwanted guests at a party, wreaking havoc in your digestive system. Symptoms can range from mild to severe, including stomach cramps, diarrhea, and vomiting. The onset can be rapid, transforming a normal day into a distressing ordeal. Fortunately, most cases of food poisoning, while uncomfortable, are often short-lived. The human body is equipped to fight off these bacterial invaders, so a hospital visit isn't usually needed. Rest, stay hydrated, and avoid certain foods to help speed up recovery. However, for some, especially the elderly, young children, and those with weakened immune systems, food poisoning can be more severe and even life-threatening. So what can we learn from Amy's experience? Prevention is key. Proper food handling, storage, and cooking can significantly reduce the risk of food poisoning. Be especially cautious with high-risk foods like seafood, poultry, and dairy. Always check the freshness and expiration dates, and when in doubt, it's safer to throw it out. By taking these steps, we can enjoy our culinary adventures without the unwanted drama of an emergency bathroom trip. Next, let's meet David. He has IBS. Stressful deadlines at work mean his gut is in constant chaos, sending him to frequent frantic bathroom trips. IBS is a common disorder affecting the large intestine, with symptoms like cramping, abdominal pain, bloating, gas, and, yes, those sudden urgent bowel movements. According to the International Foundation for Gastrointestinal Disorders, IBS affects between 25 and 45 million people in the United States alone. That's a significant portion of the population grappling with this unpredictable condition. For David, his high-pressure job means constant stress, a well-known trigger for IBS flare-ups. Stress doesn't just affect the mind, it has a direct impact on the gut. This gut-brain connection can turn emotional turmoil into physical discomfort. In David's case, his body's response to stress is an all-too-frequent and frantic dash to the restroom. It's not just discomfort, it's disruption to his daily life. IBS is a chronic condition, but it is manageable. David learned that lifestyle changes could significantly improve his symptoms. This includes dietary adjustments, stress management techniques, and sometimes medication. For many with IBS, identifying and avoiding specific trigger foods can be a game-changer. Stress reduction strategies like mindfulness, exercise, or therapy can also help keep the symptoms in check. David's story is a testament to the power of understanding and managing one's condition. While IBS remains a chronic condition, with no one-size-fits-all solution, individuals like David find ways to regain control over their lives. The key is awareness, management, and a supportive healthcare team. Now let's meet Emma. She loves lattes, but her daily pre-work mocha latte ritual takes an unexpected turn due to her lactose intolerance. Lactose intolerance is a common digestive problem where the body is unable to digest lactose. 
a type of sugar mainly found in milk and dairy products. According to the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, approximately 68% of the global population has some degree of lactose intolerance. This condition is most prevalent in people of East Asian descent, affecting about 90% of adults in those communities. For Emma, consuming dairy products, especially in large quantities like her latte, leads to symptoms such as bloating, abdominal cramps, and yes, those urgent trips to the bathroom. This happens because her body lacks enough of the enzyme lactase, which is needed to break down lactose in the digestive system. Without sufficient lactase, lactose moves through her gut undigested, causing discomfort and digestive distress. There's good news for Emma and others with lactose intolerance, though. Managing the condition doesn't have to mean giving up your favorite foods or drinks. Alternatives like lactose-free milk, almond milk, or soy milk can allow her to enjoy her beloved lattes without the digestive drama. On top of that, many find that they can tolerate certain dairy products in small amounts or those with lower lactose content, like hard cheeses and yogurt. Emma's journey is a common one for those with lactose intolerance. With a wide range of lactose-free options available on the market, it's easier than ever to enjoy dairy pleasures without the pain. It's a small change in a diet that can make a big difference in quality of life and comfort. Let's look at another coffee addict with a similar digestive experience, though with a different root cause. Meet Kevin, a graphic designer in a bustling advertising agency. Kevin's life is a whirlwind of tight deadlines and client meetings. Recently, he's been experiencing a new kind of challenge, sudden urgent bowel movements. What Kevin didn't realize initially was that his love for morning coffee, especially on an empty stomach, was the main culprit. Every morning, Kevin's routine included a large, strong cup of black coffee. Coffee, particularly in high amounts, can stimulate muscle contractions in the colon, similar to the body's response after eating a meal. For some people like Kevin, this effect is amplified, leading to an almost immediate need to use the bathroom. Kevin's emergency trips became more frequent, often at inconvenient times, like during important team meetings or client presentations. These situations were both embarrassing and stressful for him. It wasn't until a colleague mentioned that caffeine can act as a laxative that Kevin started connecting the dots. After consulting his doctor, Kevin learned that his body's reaction wasn't uncommon. His doctor advised him to cut back on the caffeine and avoid drinking coffee on an empty stomach. Kevin also started incorporating more water and fiber-rich foods into his diet to support his digestive health. Today, Kevin still enjoys his morning coffee, but in moderation and after a healthy breakfast. This simple change in routine has significantly reduced his unexpected bathroom dashes. Kevin's story is a reminder that sometimes our favorite habits can have unintended effects on our bodies, and a small change can make a big difference in our daily comfort and well-being. Next up, meet Mia, a freelance writer who works from home. Mia loves to experiment with exotic foods and spices in her cooking. Recently, she's been facing a rather discomforting issue, frequent emergency bowel movements. Little did she know her adventurous culinary experiments were to blame. Mia's passion for spicy foods, rich in capsaicin, the compound that gives chili peppers their heat, was the main factor. Capsaicin can irritate the lining of the stomach and intestines, leading to increased bowel movements from some people. For Mia, indulging in spicy meals often resulted in unexpected dashes to the bathroom. It wasn't long before Mia noticed a pattern. Her love for spicy dishes was taking a toll on her digestive system. Every fiery meal seemed to be followed by an urgent need to visit the restroom. This realization was both surprising and a bit upsetting given her culinary preferences. Seeking a solution, Mia consulted a dietitian. She learned about the impact of capsaicin on the digestive system and the importance of balancing her diet. The dietitian suggested incorporating milder flavors and avoiding extremely spicy foods, especially during busy workdays. With some adjustments to her recipes, Mia has been able to find a happy medium. She still enjoys the flavors she loves, but now in a way that's kinder to her digestive system. This change has allowed her to continue her culinary adventures without the unwanted side effects. What other issues can cause sudden, seemingly uncontrollable BMs? Let's turn our attention to Josh and his battle with celiac disease. Celiac disease is an autoimmune disorder where the ingestion of gluten leads to damage in the small intestine. According to the Celiac Disease Foundation, this condition affects 1 in 100 people worldwide. For Josh, a simple pasta meal is enough to trigger a reaction, as his immune system mistakenly attacks his small intestine's lining upon detecting gluten. When Josh consumes gluten, a protein found in wheat, barley, and rye, his body's immune response is activated. 
but it mistakenly targets the villi in his small intestine. These tiny finger-like projections are crucial for nutrient absorption. The resulting inflammation and flattening of the villi lead to symptoms like diarrhea, fatigue, and even emergency bowel movements. You shouldn't treat it as something that just causes discomfort, though. It's a severe health concern. Diagnosing celiac disease can be challenging, as its symptoms often overlap with other digestive disorders. For Josh, getting a proper diagnosis was a journey of consultations and tests, but it was a turning point. Once diagnosed, the treatment for celiac disease is strict adherence to a gluten-free diet. This dietary change is not a fad for Josh, it's a necessity for his health and well-being. Living with celiac disease has its challenges, but Josh discovered a world of gluten-free alternatives. He's now exploring new recipes and enjoying meals that are safe for him. This shift in diet has not only alleviated his symptoms, but also improved his overall quality of life. Okay, so what about mental and emotional health? Could those be a contributing factor to emergency poop situations? To find out, let's look at Lucy, a college student. Lucy's experience sheds light on the often overlooked connection between stress, anxiety, and digestive health. The American Psychological Association reports that stress and anxiety are prevalent among college students, with over 40% feeling more than an average amount of anxiety. For Lucy, the pressure of exams and maintaining a social life manifests not just in mental strain, but also in physical symptoms, including those sudden urgent trips to the bathroom. The stress triggers her gut, leading to sudden urgent bathroom breaks. Yeah, that's right, stress and anxiety can physically affect your digestive system. The link between the brain and the gastrointestinal system, often referred to as the gut-brain axis, plays a crucial role in how our bodies respond to stress. In Lucy's case, the heightened state of anxiety sends signals to her gut, leading to gastrointestinal distress. This can result in a range of symptoms, from stomach cramps to diarrhea. Understanding the root of these symptoms, Lucy took steps to manage her stress and anxiety. Activities like yoga and mindfulness meditation have proven to be effective for many in reducing stress levels. Additionally, counseling services on campus provided her with strategies to cope with academic pressures. These approaches not only helped her manage stress, but also significantly reduced her digestive issues. Inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD, encompasses conditions like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, which our next character Mark is unfortunately familiar with. According to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, IBD affects an estimated 3 million Americans. This chronic condition causes inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract, leading to a range of symptoms including severe diarrhea, abdominal pain, fatigue, and weight loss. For Mark, this means not just physical discomfort, but also a significant impact on his daily life and activities. Mark's journey with IBD has been challenging. Crohn's disease, in his case, leads to frequent urgent bowel movements, a symptom that's both unpredictable and distressing. These symptoms are a result of his immune system mistakenly attacking the gastrointestinal tract, causing chronic inflammation. The urgency and frequency of these bowel movements can often make social situations and everyday tasks daunting for individuals like Mark. But there's hope and support for those living with IBD. Mark found solace and information in support groups, where he learned management strategies and connected with others facing similar challenges. Advances in medical treatment, including medication and sometimes surgery, have also played a crucial role in managing his condition. These treatments aim to reduce inflammation, control symptoms, and prolong periods of remission. Now, let's turn our attention to Mrs. Jenkins. Like many others, she relies on certain medications for her health. Recently, she started a course of antibiotics for a chest infection. Antibiotics are crucial in fighting bacterial infections, but they come with their own set of challenges. According to the studies conducted on antibiotic use, about 30% of antibiotics prescribed in outpatient settings are unnecessary. This overprescription not only contributes to antibiotic resistance, but also can disrupt the natural balance of gut flora, leading to gastrointestinal issues like diarrhea. For Mrs. Jenkins, her antibiotic treatment has an unintended side effect, disrupting her gut microbiome. The gut microbiome is a complex ecosystem of bacteria vital for digestive health. Antibiotics, while targeting harmful bacteria, can also inadvertently eliminate beneficial gut bacteria. This imbalance often results in digestive upset, manifesting as urgent and frequent bowel movements, a condition known as antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Recognizing the issue, Mrs. Jenkins consulted her doctor, who advised her on ways to manage these side effects. Probiotics, either as supplements or through dietary sources like yogurt, 
can help restore the balance of gut flora. Her doctor also emphasized the importance of taking antibiotics only as prescribed and finishing the entire course to prevent resistance and further complications. Now, Mrs. Jenkins is more mindful of her gut health while on medication. With the right advice and adjustments, she's able to manage the side effects effectively. Food allergies can be more than just an inconvenience, as our next example, Sarah, learned during her picnic. After inadvertently consuming a sandwich with peanut butter, her body's immune system had a severe allergic reaction. The American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology states that about 4-6% to of children and 4% of adults in the U.S. are affected by food allergies. For these individuals, exposure to certain foods like peanuts for Sarah can trigger a range of symptoms from mild to life-threatening. In Sarah's case, the allergic reaction not only caused traditional symptoms like hives and swelling, but also gastrointestinal distress. This is because her immune system misidentified the proteins in the peanuts as harmful, triggering a chain of reactions. For many with food allergies, this can include emergency bowel movements as the body tries to expel the allergen as quickly as possible. Realizing the seriousness of her condition, Sarah visited an allergist. She learned the importance of reading labels, understanding cross-contamination risks, and recognizing early signs of an allergic reaction. She also discovered that carrying an epinephrine auto-injector could be life-saving in case of severe reactions. Education and preparedness became key in managing her food allergy. Now let's talk about what many assume an emergency poop is all about, being sick. It's true, a stomach bug can absolutely cause that gotta go now feeling. Let's look at Tom's encounter with gastroenteritis, commonly known as the stomach flu, a story many can relate to. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, millions of cases of gastroenteritis occur in the United States each year. This condition, often caused by viral or bacterial infections, inflames the stomach and intestines, leading to symptoms like diarrhea, vomiting, and stomach cramps. For Tom, who caught the bug from his kids, it meant being out of action and in close proximity to the bathroom. Tom began to feel the adverse effects soon after his kids fell ill. Gastroenteritis is highly contagious, and despite his best efforts, he couldn't avoid catching it. Initially, he thought it was just a mild upset stomach, but it quickly escalated into frequent urgent trips to the bathroom. The rapid onset is characteristic of gastroenteritis, catching many off guard. When Tom visited his doctor, he learned that rest, hydration, and a bland diet are key to recovery. Gastroenteritis usually resolves on its own, but dehydration can be a serious concern, especially with severe symptoms. His doctor emphasized the importance of drinking plenty of fluids and any other methods of rehydration. Thankfully, Tom's story has a positive ending. After a few days of rest and proper care, he was back on his feet, now aware of the dangers of gastroenteritis. Let's look at one more example of GI distress causers. Leo is trying to cut down on his sugar intake, and his experience highlights an often overlooked issue with artificial sweeteners. While trying to make healthier choices, he switched to sports drinks with artificial sweeteners. However, what seemed like a smart health decision had unintended consequences. According to research published in the Yale Journal of Biology and Medicine, some artificial sweeteners can have a laxative effect, particularly when consumed in large quantities. These sweeteners found in a variety of diet and low-calorie products can lead to gastrointestinal symptoms like bloating, gas, and urgent bowel movements. Curious about the cause of his discomfort, Leo started investigating the ingredients in his diet. He was surprised to find that many products labeled as sugar-free or diet contained artificial sweeteners like sorbitol, xylitol, and mannitol. These sugar alcohols are not fully absorbed by the body and can draw water into the bowel, causing diarrhea and a laxative effect. This was a revelation to Leo, who had been unknowingly consuming large amounts of these sweeteners. Seeking advice, he consulted a dietitian. He learned the importance of reading food labels and understanding the potential side effects of artificial sweeteners. The dietitian recommended natural sweeteners and emphasized a balanced diet, highlighting that moderation is key even when it comes to healthier choices. For Leo, this meant rethinking his approach to dieting and making more informed decisions about what he consumes. Now, Leo is more cautious with his dietary choices. He learned that sugar-free doesn't always mean trouble-free for his digestive system. By choosing natural sweeteners and maintaining a balanced diet, he's managed to avoid the unpleasant side effects he previously experienced. Leo's story is a reminder that sometimes, in our quest for health, we might overlook the fine print, and that understanding the ingredients in our food can have a significant impact on our overall well-being. But what can you specifically do if you find yourself experiencing emergency bowel movements? Let's explore some specific treatments and methods that can help. 
First and foremost, staying hydrated is crucial. Dietary adjustments can also play a key role in managing symptoms. For immediate relief, a bland diet including foods like bananas, rice, applesauce, and toast, commonly referred to as the brat diet, can be gentle on your stomach. Over-the-counter medications can also offer relief. Antidiarrheal medications like loperamide can slow down the movement of the gut and reduce the frequency of bowel movements. However, it's important to use those medications only as directed and consult with a healthcare professional if symptoms persist. In some cases, like with bacterial infections, antibiotics prescribed by a doctor might be necessary. Everyone has to go to the bathroom. Uncles, aunties, sisters, brothers, the man who runs the convenience store, and the little old lady who feeds the ducks at the park. In fact, the little old lady who feeds the ducks at the park may need to visit the bathroom more than most of us. Imagine the most attractive member of the opposite sex. Now imagine them sitting on the toilet. They don't seem so unapproachable now, right? But what if we were never allowed to fulfill that basic of human functions again? Would we die from overbaking that killer stool? Or would we find a way to stay alive despite the serious backlog? In today's episode of The Infographic Show, we will find out what if you never pooped again. A 24-year-old in England is baking a serious turd and refusing to poop, following his arrest for drug dealing on January 17, 2018. The colon-hardened criminal refused to eat a single thing, and police suspect that he'd swallowed the evidence and managed to hold out for 43 days without once evacuating his bowels. So that story led us at The Infographic Show to wonder just how long he could hold out holding in. And what happens when you hold back from defecating for such a length of time? Let's find out by first looking at what we already know about fecal retention. Voluntarily withholding stools for periods of time, or fecal retention as it is charmingly known, is usually related to bowel-related problems such as chronic constipation. If one is eating but not using the john for a number two every day, the colon can become dangerously distended in a condition known as megacolon. Yes, megacolon is not a grade B horror movie, it is an actual medical condition. The poop becomes hard and impacted as it backs up, and in worst case scenarios, the bowel can rupture and the colon, which has now earned its mega title, can extend up into the ribcage. An x-ray of a 13-year-old girl with functional fecal retention syndrome is set to show that the little minx, who claimed to have not gone to the crapper in the last year, had some serious back blockage. This fecal retention syndrome is most seen in kids who develop some kind of fear around sitting on the john, having had some severely painful experiences in that arena in the past. If you've ever had constipation, you can surely elicit a little empathy for these bog-shy children. The patient or sufferer of fecal retention learns to tighten the pelvic muscles and buttocks when the urge to defecate occurs. Although tiny drops of fecal matter may circumnavigate past the larger stool mass and liberate into the patient's bright cotton underwear, the larger mass of solid stool remains firmly lodged, growing larger and larger and more menacing each and every day. Some kids can retain their feces for weeks or even months, and the only real remedy is the introduction of laxatives or stool softeners to break up that impending turd mass. If one were to refuse, like our English criminal, to take in food, eventually malnutrition would become an issue, and although the patient would be able to survive on intravenous nutrition, he would at some point need to poop. There is, however, a danger that if you continually hold back the pooping reflex, then bowel motility will in the future be trained to hold back. And then what? So what's the longest period of time a fellow human being has gone without pooping? A man with Hirschsprung's disease didn't poop for 13 years and died at the age of 29. His colon grew to 7 feet long and weighed 47 pounds and is on display at the Medical Oddities Mutter Museum in Philadelphia for those who don't believe us. The birth defect, shared by the King of Rock Elvis Presley, who died on the throne, affects the large intestine, preventing bowel movements, and leads to constipation, diarrhea, vomiting, and in Elvis's case, a string of hit records. So holding in that poop won't kill you, but sooner or later you will have to let the dogs out or else you may end up chronically constipated. If you habitually hold back on the urge to poop, you are training your sphincters to work against your body. The body has two sphincters, the inner and the outer. The inner is controlled subconsciously and will open to liberate a sample of the poop. Your body then conducts a kind of fart versus turd analysis to determine the state of play and decides if to open or close the outer sphincter, a process which you should be in control of. 
I'm sure most of us have experienced a situation where the body was unsure as to the solidity of our fecal exposition, resulting in a major disaster in the underwear department. Avoid this. Ideally, you should give the body the opportunity to poop whenever it so desires and be close to the means to do so at all times. If you keep holding on to that turd, the connection between your two sphincters will become blurred and eventually they will give up sending signals to each other, resulting in major bum-related confusion. Walking home from that new Thai restaurant that just opened in town, you suddenly feel that dreaded twist in your stomach. The universal sign that a monstrosity of poop is on its way, and it's not the kind of poop you can hold in. Why, oh why did you ask for extra chilies in that Tom Yam spicy soup? You run so fast to your house that if you'd been seen, you might have been picked up for the US Olympic sprinting team. You almost lose your stash at the door, now gripping those cheeks together with such force you could crush a walnut between them. Oh, what a relief as your load hits the pool and decorates that pristine ceramic receptacle. Now at ease, you pull out your phone and hit the infographic show, since there's nothing better than animated fact-filled fun in the midst of post-poop ecstasy. Something then happens to you that's arguably one of humanity's worst fears. Something so bad you'd spend a week stepping on Legos to prevent it happening. You want to flush your giant load of spicy detritus down that hallowed hole, and in doing so, your brand new iPhone slipped out of your hands and went with it. That's a thousand dollar poo you just took, and suddenly, you're not so concerned about that ring of fire under your shorts. Maybe it didn't go down too far, you muse. But before you investigate, you have to clean your Jackson Pollock-esque artwork off the porcelain walls. First, you look around for some rubber gloves and any bottle that has a skull and crossbones on the label. Okay, you say to yourself, you can do this. Others have, you can do it too. The cleaning then commences. Nothing. You reach inside that mysterious hole and you find nothing. Your iPhone must have set sail, embarked on an exciting adventure into the underworld. Only you have no idea where that underworld leads. For you, the toilet is merely a bowl, and once you've filled and flushed, you never thought much about the rest of the operation. For a second, you feel a little bit guilty, slightly ignorant. It suddenly hits you that that poop of yours, those thousands of poops you've done from school to the workplace to home, have been taken care of in your absence. Philosophically, you muse, there's another universe out there dedicated to deal with your dumps. You also want that iPhone back. You're pretty sure that for a thousand bucks, it's gotta be poop proof. If Steve Jobs were alive today, he'd definitely have made all devices poop friendly. So how do you follow the phone? It's difficult given that you can't exactly get down that hole. Okay, so that guy in the movie Train Spotting did it, but that was just a movie. The scene was surreal. It was symbolic, not real life. Then it hits you. If they can do that in the movies, then the infographic show can do it in animation. Thankfully, you have the phone number of the writer writing this script. You go to get the old phone and you call him. The conversation goes like this. Hey, uh, infographics writer, I'm a guy in one of your plots and I'm wondering if you can make me real small so I can go retrieve an expensive smartphone from the toilet and by doing so explain to viewers what happens to poop. Um, sure, I can do that for you buddy, it'll be easy. In writing we call something like this deus ex machina. It's a plot device when something totally unexpected or unbelievable happens, usually to help the protagonist, in this case, you. Yeah, thanks so much. By the way, can you do a face reveal? Good luck, bye! Then all of a sudden, you're just a few inches tall, but thankfully, during that deus ex machina, the infographic show writer has created a stairway of Lego bricks that leads to the edge of the toilet seat. At the bottom of the stairs, there's a sign, and it reads, Stairway to Heaven. You guess that smiley face is a bit sinister, and you're pretty sure that if there's anything that glitters down there, it's likely only toxic algae. You climb to the top, and there waiting for you is a miniature scuba diving kit, and so you slip into that. Okay, you think? Time to take the plunge. Three, two, one, jump! You're now submerged in the water. Soon you find yourself inside something called a sewerage pipe, and you swim with this downhill. At the start, visibility is fine. But then, you find that this one pipe joins an even bigger pipe, and suddenly your world turns darker. And while you have a headlamp on, there's just so much rubbish in front of you. It's like navigating a meteorite storm, except the stones are actually poop. It's a pooperite storm, and it's not pleasant. 
You can see that this big pipe is connected to all the pipes on the street, and from those pipes you can see thick brown water emerging mixed with tissue paper that, now wet, looks kind of like translucent stained brown jellyfish. Some of it wraps around your mask and you wonder which neighbor's excrement you've just got intimate with. You're startled because this large pipe could fit a bus inside it. It's certainly a tunnel of gloom, a Hades of excrement and hair, and God knows what else. When you look up to the side, you see rats scurrying around nibbling on bits of food waste that cling to the filthy walls. How on earth will you find your iPhone in all of this? You daren't even go close to the side of the tunnel where a lot of waste collects, since those rats could rip off your tiny head in an instant. Maybe this mission wasn't worth a thousand bucks, you think, but there's no going back now. Sewers are like rivers. They flow one way, and swimming against a sea of poo would be unthinkable, if not impossible. There is no way you're going to take that mask off because you learned in school that in the sewage water there are parasites as well as all kinds of bacteria and viruses. For a small man like yourself, this might be the most dangerous place on earth. The next words that flash through your mind are, eat your heart out, Bear Grylls. Would he do the sewer challenge? Not likely. You can just imagine him surviving on sandwiches, that's poop between two slices of wet tissue. The entree, of course, is cold poop soup. You keep swimming in this putrid water, trying hard not to get near the bottom. The reason for this is what lies at the bottom is a world of thick poop. There's a sign on the wall with a picture of this mess and the words, sewer sludge. Get stuck in the sludge and your cause of death will be suffocation by poop. That's not the way you want to go. You're going to follow the water since you're sure your phone has been taken with it. But as you're swimming down that tunnel, you meet another guy that has also been shrunken by the writer to make this show make more sense. Since at the start the writer said you knew nothing about sewerage systems, he takes off his mask and tells you that poop sludge and whatever else is in it doesn't just stay there, that would be dangerous. It would become very toxic. He tells you that if you want to know just how bad untreated poop sludge can get, just read about the Great Stink in London in 1858. This little guy explains to you that there's something called the activated sludge process, which is basically a process in which microorganisms feed on the organic compound rich material, namely lots of people's poop. Then it's given more oxygen in what's called a mechanical aeration process, and the outcome should be cleaner liquid. What's left can be dried out, and the dry stuff can be used as fertilizer. He tells you what goes in comes out, but in a way goes in again. For a second, you wonder if that makes you a coprophiliac a poop eater, but you quickly brush that thought away. The small guy notices your concerned expression and says smiling, waste not, want not. Anyway, you say, I have to get to that phone, thanks for the education, and I promise to check out the great stink just as soon as I'm big again. You swim and swim past more poop, past more rats, past rats covered in poop, past poop covered in rats, past people's poop covered in other people's poop. Tissue, hair, even candy wrappers at one point get stuck on your mask. A few seconds later and a used open diaper covers your face like that scene out of Alien. This is nothing like that time you scuba dived in the Maldives. But then suddenly this dark world opens up into a much more pleasant looking pool of water and you see a sign that reads sewage treatment plant. You manage to climb to the side of this pool and since you're so small no one can see you. You witness chemicals being added to the water and you guess this is the treatment part. You hear two guys talking and it looks like one of those bosses explaining to a new kid how it all works. He says that it takes days to clean the water and after that it might be released into rivers or oceans but you've got to be really careful because if it's not cleaned properly, it can pollute those rivers and oceans. The guy says this has happened before many times. This guy explains that perfect cleaning is what happens at this plant, but he said at some other places the treated water can be used in farms or factories, while some countries will turn that stuff into drinking water. After what you've just seen in that river of refuse, that foul and infested lair where no man should ever go, all you can do is gulp. The first thing you'll do when you're big is find out where sewage is treated into the something you later drink. You've come this far and you will stop at nothing to get back your beloved iPhone. You're a smart guy and you know there must be a part of the facility where all the stuff you shouldn't flush, the stuff that makes it past the sludge, will collect. And then you see it, a giant grate where a bunch of things have collected. You put the mask back on and start swimming toward the mound of junk. When you get there, you're startled because when you take off your mask, staring right at you is a doll's head, just the head, not the body. 
You start pulling items out of the pile, finding things such as a Justin Bieber action figure, a bunch of used diapers, this makes you wretch, tons of cigarette butts, sanitary pads, enough dental floss to wrap around a small town, lots of plastic spoons. You even find a grill, a multicolored one, so you expect it was worn by Takashi69. In fact, there are dentures everywhere, but you've got a full set of teeth and you just want that iPhone. One thing you thought you'd find was about 3 million unwanted goldfish or those that had gone to goldfish heaven but there wasn't a fish in sight. Finally, you see it. Your iPhone nestled between what looks like a half-eaten cat and a gang of hypodermic syringes. At your size, wrestling the thing out of the pile isn't easy, but eventually you get it to dry land. You clean it down with some dirty tissue, and then by using your feet, you can call the infographics writer again. Ring, 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 ring. You call again and again, now scared out of your wits that you'll remain this size forever. Ever. What you don't know is that it's Friday and it's 5 p.m. and this infographic show writer is really, really hungry. His girlfriend is waving a bottle of quality wine at him and she's getting more upset by the minute because he's been taking so long to write a show about, well, about poop of all things. Frankly, she's not impressed. So sorry, buddy. It looks like there just isn't enough time to make you big again. Maybe next time, if I'm in the mood to employ a bit of deus ex machina, I'll change you back. Adios, chapo. What's the deal with anuses? Is it true that at one point in our development, we were all nothing more than an anus? What exactly is it even for? What's it made of? And how is this all connected to an unexploded World War I artillery shell? Well, hold on to your butts, because we're about to answer all these burning questions and more. Hey, you in the back, stop giggling, this is a serious scientific video. The word anus is actually derived from Latin and translates to ring or circle in English. We've all got one and, let's be honest here, we all know what they're for. The anus, well, for humans and most animals alike, plays a vital role in our digestive systems as well as, well, let's just say what comes after for now. Despite everyone on the planet owning one, talking about the anus and its functions can often be considered something of a taboo and even a disgusting topic to some. That can lead to some of us even feeling shame or disgust at ourselves if we develop certain disorders or conditions that affect the anus which in turn can cause it to become a difficult topic to broach when seeking medical assistance for those problems. Just like developing our understanding of any other part of our bodies, getting to grips with the anus can allow us to better appreciate its significance and eliminate any misconceptions we might have. As somebody who owns an anus, you might already know the primary bodily function of the anus is to regulate the exit of feces from the body. In order to do this, an anus is located at the end of the rectum. Hold on a moment. Aren't those the same thing? Well, while you might have heard them used interchangeably, either as insults or for some highbrow jokes, the anus and the rectum are actually two distinct parts of the digestive system. Speaking of which, let's take a look at the whole process to get an idea of exactly how the anus functions as part of this important bodily function. You see, as many of you are already aware, your digestive system has both a small and a large intestine. These are the two large tubes that perform a process known as peristalsis. This is the name given to the movement of the inner walls of those hollow internal organs. Both the small and the large intestines contain a layer of muscle in order to move food and liquid through your gastrointestinal tract. As the muscle behind all the food you consume contracts, it squeezes all that food forward while the portion of the muscle in front relaxes, allowing everything you've eaten and drank to pass through it. Once you've eaten or drank something, you might not give much thought to where it goes once it's no longer in your mouth. But from there, it travels down your esophagus, which also performs this process of peristalsis. The reason you've never noticed is because it's completely automatic. Your brain sends electrical signals through your body to the relevant parts involved in specific biological and physiological processes, meaning it all takes place without you ever having to think about it. That's also how food passes from your esophagus through your lower esophageal sphincter, a ring of muscle that's essentially the door to your stomach, designed to let in what you eat, while also preventing your potentially harmful stomach acid from getting out. Your stomach, as you probably know, is responsible for mixing your eaten foods with acids that break it down as part of the digestive process. These resultant contents are known as chyme, and that's what then gets passed through your small intestine. There, the muscles of your small intestine add further digestive juices from certain organs like your pancreas and your liver. They'll also extract and absorb water and nutrients from your food and add those to your bloodstream. 
Next, the leftover waste products are moved into your large intestine as the process of peristalsis continues. Any of the waste going through the large intestine, normally consisting of undigested food, excess fluid, and even your old cells from the lining of your gastrointestinal tract, changes into, well, the end result. That waste continues from your intestines to your colon, which is made of much the same stuff, namely layers of muscle and tissue with glands that can absorb and secrete different substances. After going through the length of the colon, food waste then heads to the rectum, and now you're going to find out the difference. You see, the rectum is located at the lower end of your large intestines, which are long continuous tubes that also include your colon and the anus. Your rectum is where the food that's been reduced to solid waste is stored. Once it arrives, the rectum stores the waste and absorbs any remaining water until the time comes to release it. Think of it as the last stop right at the end of the line before the train that leaves and heads off toward its shed. It's a journey that starts when your food enters your mouth and terminates when it gets to the last six inches or so of your large intestine. Once it arrives there, it just has to wait for one last signal before it's able to make its final departure. Your rectum is connected to an anal canal, where your food makes its eventual exit from your body. As the remaining waste passes from your colon and then into your rectum, it collects there until your nerve endings trigger your urge to… well, there's no nice way to say this, but your urge to poop. When that waste matter moves into the rectum, nerve receptors located there will send signals to your brain, alerting you that you need to evacuate the waste, or if it's just gas. If it's the latter, then your brain knows it's safe to expel it without issue. Well. That's not always a basket of roses for whoever happens to be sitting next to you. If it's time to get rid of the waste, those same nerves will let you know to get moving to the nearest bathroom. Similarly, the anus has a high concentration of nerve endings, making it a highly sensitive area of the body. This sensitivity can vary from person to person, but typically the anal canal continues on from your rectum, making up the last few centimeters of the large intestine. The anus consists of a ring of muscle and actually has several other important muscles that aid in its function. The anal canal is surrounded by these ring-like muscles that are called sphincters that are designed to control your bowel movements. Both of those, the external and internal sphincters, are located at the anus. The external one is voluntary, meaning it can be contracted or relaxed at will, while the internal sphincter does so involuntarily. The canal is also lined with a mucous membrane, a thin layer of moist tissue containing glands that produce mucus, a slippery fluid that can help that waste to make its dramatic exit, and from there, well, you don't need us to tell you what happens. Let's instead talk about some other things that you might not know about the anus. The anus is actually part of your body's most powerful group of muscles, along with the gluteus maximus, the gluteus medius, and the gluteus minimus. Much like other muscles in the body, the anus possesses a degree of elasticity, meaning it can stretch and then return to its original state. This allows our muscles to carry out their specific function, and the anus is no exception. That also means, again, just like the other muscles, the more you exercise it, the stronger it can get. Pilates is actually a great way to strengthen your pelvic floor muscles, which the anus is connected to. Now, as we mentioned before, largely given the role it plays in our digestion, the anus is socially considered to be a taboo part of the body. As a result, you might often hear some people refer to it using slang terminology. There are well over 50 different colloquial terms for the anus, many of which are considered to be so vulgar that they're actually considered curse words, which means that we can't cite a lot of them as examples for this video. We're already on thin ice as it is right now. Some of the slightly more esoteric ones are phrases like ring piece and starfish. We'll stop with those two before we get ourselves demonetized. Depending on the context, some of those slang terms can be considered positive, negative, or even downright nasty and vitriolic. While to some it's often considered to be something of a funny body part, hence the use of profane slang to refer to it, it's also an incredibly important part of our anatomy and shouldn't be joked about in a scientific context. Speaking of how important the anus is, did you know that without one, you could possibly die? If not, you would certainly live in a lot of discomfort. You might have heard that the anus is normally one of the first parts of the body to develop when humans begin as embryos in the womb, meaning that at some point everyone was just an asshole. Jokes aside, that's not strictly true. Humans are similar to an evolutionary branch of animals known as deuterostomes. The defining characteristic of deuterostomes is that their anus does form before their mouth while they're an embryo. 
This can be found in a number of creatures in the animal kingdom, including any vertebrates, animals with a spinal column, and in particular starfish, sea urchins, and sea cucumbers. In the case of sea cucumbers, their anus isn't just an exit for digestive waste, it's also a mouth, used for eating algae, and a defensive weapon that can launch a stringy web of internal organs at underwater predators, and its main way of breathing. Sea cucumbers are considered to be just a multi-function Swiss Army knife-style anus that just happens to have a body around it. On the other hand, human beings evolved in such a way that we no longer follow the same pattern of deuterostomes. In human embryos, the mouth forms first during the fourth week of development. Four weeks later, this is then followed by the anus, and the two are connected by a gut tube that would have already formed between them. However, sometimes human babies can in fact be born without an anus as a result of a birth defect, known as an imperforate anus. This affects one in around every 5,000 newborn babies and can occur alongside other abnormalities that affect the rectum in the anus. While we don't exactly know what causes an imperforate anus, it can manifest in a number of alarming ways. Some imperforate anuses result in a complete absence of an anal opening, while others cause the formation of an anus but in the wrong place on the body, usually a lot smaller than it needs to be. In some instances, something called a cloaca develops, which is when the anus, urethra, and other openings are all combined into a singular one. Naturally, this can lead to a whole host of problems for a newborn, with the most worrying one being that without an anus, an infant can't expel their waste, which if you or anyone you know has kids, you'll know it happens a lot. This alongside possible infections as a result of the birth defect can lead to early health complications and even death if the newborn isn't treated ASAP. This is a good time to mention the waste expelling process and how we learn about it. During our earliest stages of life, our brains haven't learned how to properly control our digestive and excretory systems yet. For older children and adults, this is like second nature. We know when our bodies are telling us we need to go, and we can even control the muscles of the anus to stop ourselves if we aren't able to get to a bathroom quickly. For infants and even some adults who develop certain neurological or muscular disorders as they grow older, that level of control just isn't possible. This is a big problem for someone born with an imperforate anus, as their large intestine doesn't end with an opening, it essentially just becomes a pouch. This can cause the waste to collect internally within the large intestine. If it stays there, it can cause vomiting or even make the abdomen swell up. The only way to treat an imperforate anus is with urgent surgery, which will create a new opening for the waste to pass through. While this surgery can differ, it typically involves three stages. The first is a procedure called a colostomy, where a stoma needs to be created. This is an external opening that brings the intestine out from under the skin. Waste is passed through the stoma into a bag that has to be worn outside the body. Yes, we know how unpleasant that sounds, but try to remember, it has to be even more uncomfortable for those unfortunate enough to have to live with one. The second part of the surgical process is called an anoplasty. This involves creating a new opening, a new anus in the usual place, and pulling the rectum down to meet it. If someone with an imperforate anus also has a fistula, a connection between the intestine and the bladder or the urethra, then that also needs to be closed off. Then after several months, once the new anus has healed, a third procedure is performed to close the stoma. While this is normally done while the person is still a baby in order for their body to adjust and for the digestive system to begin functioning properly as soon as possible, that doesn't always happen. One man in China had to go a whole 55 years without an anus in the proper place. A farmer from Hubei province named Wu was unable to afford the necessary operation until he reached his later years, which means that for half a century he had to make do with a small surgical hole around half a centimeter in diameter. He only had a stoma, part of the colostomy that makes up the initial surgical fix for an imperforate anus. Wu also had to squeeze waste out by hand, which of course sounds like a horrific and messy way to use the bathroom. He had to pay close attention to exactly what foods he ate in order to avoid constipation and use laxatives to evacuate his bowels thoroughly. In something of a happy ending though, not only did his condition not prevent Wu from getting married and having children, but he also did undergo surgery to fix the defect after five decades without proper treatment. As the anus is an orifice that leads directly into your body, naturally it makes it a site for a potential infection. There are a number of diseases that can potentially affect this part of your body, 
including anal cancer, anal fissures, which is where the lining of the anus tears, anal warts or abscesses, sexually transmitted infections, and hemorrhoids dilated, twisted blood vessels in the walls of the anus or rectum. Given just how easy it can be to develop illnesses and infections like these, it's important to practice good hygiene when it comes to the anus. Cleaning it should be done with care, either by wiping the exterior or rinsing it with water. Occasionally, some people decide to remove the naturally occurring hair that develops around the anus during puberty. Brazilian waxing, trimming, or even shaving are all ways to do this, as well as bleaching that can lighten the darker look of the anus. Speaking of showing your anus some appreciation, it often has an essential role in sexuality. For many consenting adults of varying gender identities and sexual orientations, sexual activity that involves stimulating the anus is considered an enjoyable experience. For some, the anus is actually an erogenous zone, the areas of the body most affected by enjoyable sensations. Not everyone's erogenous zones are the same, but the anus is among one of the most common. But be careful what you do down there because according to a study conducted by some scientists in New York, a staggering 4,000 Americans are taken to the hospital every year with objects lodged up their anus and stuck in their rectum. This isn't exclusively related to sexuality either, with objects ranging from marbles and bottles to stationery and even drugs. Some examples include a shampoo bottle, chicken bones, an oven mitt, a light bulb, and a water balloon. The analysis these scientists carried out revealed that almost 40,000 people were admitted to the hospital emergency departments for injuries like this between the years 2012 and 2021. In 8 out of 10 cases, the patients were men, with those in their 20s and early 30s making up a third of all those visits to the emergency room. But we know you want to hear about the craziest stories like this. Well. In 2022, an elderly man was admitted to the hospital with an undetonated World War I bomb lodged up his anus and in his rectum. No, really, we're not making this up. The man was 88 at the time when he was admitted to the Hospital saint Meuse in Toulon, southern France, with an 8-inch artillery shell that had found an unlikely target. It even triggered a bomb scare at the hospital, but luckily, bomb disposal experts were able to determine that the shell was unlikely to explode while it was still lodged inside the man. Fortunately for him, the doctors were able to remove the bomb from its confinement without any explosive incident occurring. After all, we've said thus far that you might think the anus is an inherently dirty or germ-ridden part of the body, but it is very much worth remembering that as long as you maintain a good standard of hygiene, then that simply won't be the case. In fact, it's worth remembering that there are actually more germs and bacteria present in your mouth than in your anus. No, really. It's actually a misconception that the types of harmful bacteria that can cause diseases are found in supposedly dirtier places of the body. For one, not all bacteria feed on waste matter, and for another, thanks to all the food that we intake, which could be carrying innocuous bacteria and airborne bacteria breathed in through the mouth, we actually do have more bacteria in our mouths than our anuses. Before you panic, that's not always a bad thing either. Oral bacteria also perform a lot of important functions, and most of the bacteria that enter your gut and reach the anus, harmful or otherwise, only get there because they enter through your mouth. They seek him here, they seek him there. Those Japanese cops seek him everywhere. He's the country's premier pooper, the overlord of excrement. And when he dumps his deuces on the streets, he's gone in the flash of an eye. The police were hot on his trail, but no sooner than they got a whiff of his identity, the serial stool ditcher dropped another one and laughed as he scurried away into the crowds. We kid you not, viewers, Japan had a serial pooper on its hands, which was becoming a big problem. The country first heard about him in 2019 when the public looked in shock at their TV screens and heard about a man that was mysteriously leaving poops outside buildings in busy parts of Tokyo. Back then, Tokyo authorities announced that someone had been dropping the kids off not at the pool but outside popular restaurants and shops in one of the city's busiest shopping districts. He left at least 10 piles of poop in quick succession, and police believed it was the work of the same person. That's when he was given the name Mr. Poop, or Unkoman in Japanese. Sure, it sounds funny to you, but if you've ever been to Japan, you'll know that manners, as well as a social contract people embrace to keep places clean, is a big deal. The public was absolutely horrified when it heard about Unkoman. Some of them were reminded of an earlier case in Osaka when a criminal pooper started wiping his stuff on people in the street and either running away or escaping on a bicycle. The poop police called him the Thursday man due to his picking that day to commit his crimes. But that was 2011. 
But when Mr. Poop devastated Tokyo in 2019, people were only too aware that the nightmare was starting again. We'll come back to the Osaka Pooper later, and even American Mr. and Mrs. Poops. But first, let's investigate the scoundrel that tainted the streets of Tokyo with his glorious turds. The area where this guy was working was called the Akihabara District. That's where Kusaku Nakajima had a model train store. One day, while he was showing off his new Tomix 98406JR series, someone took a huge dump right outside the store. Nakajima smelled something funny, and then he saw the pile. He ran up and down the street looking for the culprit, but how does one ascertain who recently delivered a poop? The crafty crapper struck again, this time outside a popular restaurant on Chuodori Street. No sooner than that pile was cleaned up, he struck again, and then again, and again, and again, all in the same area. It became obvious that one wretch of a human was trying to dirty up a previously spotless area. The cops were called, and the community got together to share CCTV clips. The pooper was good, very good. But one video exposed at least a bit of him. That clip showed a man pulling up a pair of black pants and running away carrying a blue backpack. Police said the guy was probably in his 30s. Then he struck again leaving an enormous dump outside a shop. It was still steaming when the owner first saw it, but it seemed the poopetrator was nowhere to be seen. There was nothing the store owners could really do besides keep an eye out for Mr. Poop, but they might at least put signs up in their store windows warning people that there was the possibility they might be affronted by a pile of human dung. Today, it remains an unsolved mystery. Mr. Poop never pooped again in the district. But the question is, did he start up again somewhere else where surveillance wasn't so great? After all, when a person is overcome by such deranged urges, they usually don't just get sane all of a sudden. Well, they might, as you shall see. Then in 2021 in the city of Osaka, a man started his very own dirty smear campaign. On the evening of July 29th, a woman was walking down the street in Suita City in Osaka Prefecture when she noticed a familiar smell poop. She thought at first it must be the sewers, but then the smell seemed to follow her. After about 30 minutes, she knew something was up. The stench was all around her as if she'd had her very own poop shadow. Then she took off her backpack and to her utter astonishment, it was covered in human feces. She went straight to the cops. About a month later, the police arrested a 24-year-old man in the same city. The arrest was for assault and damage to property, but when the cops opened the guy's bag, they found a full bottle of watery poop. It was obvious he'd used it for squirting feces on people since it had a tube attached to it. We're going to talk more about the psychological matters later, but the reason for his poop attacks were said to be stress. The guy had just gotten a divorce, and so it was thought that along with the stress, he also harbored some antipathy towards women. Japanese people took to web forums to air their views and try to understand the pooper. One person just asked, how did he get it in the bottle? Good question. But such practicalities are not our concern today. We want to understand this phenomenon better. It's a lot more common than you think. On December 8, 2011, a woman was riding her bicycle in Osaka's Higashinari Ward. Suddenly, a man rode up beside her and leaned over to wipe poop on her. The guy rode away, leaving the woman in shock. He did the same to another target just a few minutes later. For weeks after, every Thursday, the same person rubbed poop on someone in the same district, hence he got the name the Thursday Man. A Japanese professor explained, he tends to obtain his pleasure by acting within a fixed set of rules. That's why it's always on the same day. As for why he did it, a psychology professor at Miji University said it was his way of attaining intimacy with women. He obviously had mental problems and zero confidence, so the only way he could really feel close to a woman was rubbing a part of him on her that no one else would usually ever see. It doesn't just happen in Japan. Criminal poopers are everywhere. You've likely rubbed shoulders with one in your lifetime, but you just didn't know it. No way, you're thinking. That's because you've never heard of the Bowel Movement Bandit. In 2015, this man terrified the citizens of Akron, Ohio in the US. For three years, this guy had been covering cars with his feces, and cops had no idea who he was. Then the parents of a young woman had had enough. The guy had chosen the daughter's car for a few occasions, which you can imagine is not what she wanted to wake up to in the morning. That's why the parents set up a camera close to the car, so the next time this defiler of driveways came around and did his thing, he'd be caught in the act. It worked, because the pooper did come back. He just couldn't stop himself, and when he pooped this time, he was a sitting duck. That was a few years ago. Someone wrote on Facebook, did they ever catch the guy? There was no reply to that. They never did catch him, but what we want to know is what drove this serial pooper to commit his crimes. Police said it wasn't because he had a beef with someone, it was something more to do with mental illness, just like in Japan. In 2018, the BBC asked the question, serial poopers, what makes people poo in public places? Believe it or not, the Beeb said what happened in Japan and what happened in Ohio is way more common than people think. The article mentioned the notorious Brisbane pooper, an Australian guy who pooped on the same public pathway 30 times before he was finally caught. In the end, it was residents that stopped him after setting up cameras. 
the guy was 64 years old. He had recently retired from a high-paying corporate job. He was someone's father. He was a loving grandfather. He even sat on the Brisbane City Council Board. We'll forgive you for being confused right now. That's not what you'd expect to hear about a delinquent doo doo discharger. A clinical forensic psychologist in Birmingham City tried to explain why a successful guy like this would go on such a slime spree. He said he usually boils down to a few things. They include storing up a lot of rage, having anxiety issues, just being ill, and the obvious, someone wanting to send a strong message. But the message thing would mean having an enemy, and no one we've talked about today had one single enemy, unless the enemy was society itself or the opposite sex. In these cases, the reason is rage more than sending a message. Interestingly, the professor said, I've worked on cases where burglars have crapped in the house, and I always ask the police whether it's soft or hard. They look at me like I'm absolutely mad. And I say if it's soft, then it's somebody who's anxious. So you get a kid who goes and craps on the bed. And if it's really hard stool, then it's an indication that somebody who is angry and bitter. For some people, when you've gotta go, you gotta go. Sometimes when a person's stomach is hurting and they suffer from certain diseases, there's absolutely nothing they can do, which is unfortunate in this day and age when everyone is a walking viral video maker. We'll come back to the meaning of this public menace, but first let's now tell you another story. This person became known as the Mad Pooper after she left poops everywhere in 2017 in Colorado Springs, Colorado. She was a jogger who on her daily run would poop on pathways and outside of houses. People at first thought it must have been because of a medical issue, but really, did she have to just poop in the street when there were public restrooms around? Maybe she did have a health problem, but some people said it was more likely a psychological thing. Like the others in this show, she couldn't stop herself. This is intentional, a victim of her poop told the Washington Post. He said it was more than just having bowel issues. There were public bathrooms really close to where she did her damage. She changed her route now and again, one time pooping close to a Walgreens drugstore, and many times using people's back gardens. Residents then left her notes where they thought she might do her next hit. She ended up pooping close to those notes. The woman was unstoppable, a far more dangerous defecator than Tokyo's Mr. Poop. The magazine Runner's World then left her a message that read, As runners, we need to understand having a sudden emergency now and then, but when it becomes a habit, you need to change up your regimen. And then, just like that, she was gone. Her poops no longer stained the pathways of Colorado Springs. She just gave up. But that left us, the innocent public, never getting any closure. What was it with this jogger? What had driven her to paint the streets brown? This is what a leading expert on the matter concluded. The mad pooper's abnormal impulse may or may not be exhibitionism. She might feel instead an overwhelming urge to experience the sensation of a bowel movement out in open air, or to flaunt social rules, break the law, and get away with it. So she raged against the machine. It's a fitting analysis, especially in Japan where the machine parts are continually stressed and often work themselves into a state of frenzied stress, pooping against the machine. That seems plausible. Such rage-based pooping was likely why New Zealand's brown bomber fired off six poops in six weeks at a swimming pool in the Splash Palace Aquatic Center. No one was ever caught. No doubt the Portland pooper in 2015 felt justified in pinching off dookies in public because he too was enraged by something. Again, these kinds of serial poopers are a different breed to one-off street spoilers who might have just had a spicy Indian curry the night before or had a beef with a neighbor. If it's more than a few poops with no specific target, the poop is pathological. The psychologist talking to the BBC said, I mean, somebody who defecates in public has mental health issues. It's as simple as that. If you're socialized, that's the last thing you'd want to do. Thankfully, in every case that we can see, once the pooper gets it out of their system, we mean the rage, not the poop. Okay, we mean both. Once the pooper gets it out of their system, it seems they give up after a while. Sure, the social media posts and videos may force them to stop spreading their DNA on the street, but it's likely after a few rogue poops they do feel some relief. Veni vidi defecare. I came, I saw, I pooped. Job done. What a relief. Do you know where your coffee comes from? Would you care if what you were drinking partly came from poop? Not only do people drink such a thing, they pay top dollar for it. Here's the story of the world's most expensive coffee. Let's go back to the beginning, way back. 1596, the first Dutch traders come to Indonesia, hoping to get in on the lucrative spice trade that was then dominated by Portuguese traders. In 1602, the Dutch East India Company was established, combining rival companies into one corporation. Through the company, the Dutch colonized much of Indonesia, using their hold on the land to expand into other ventures. That, of course, included coffee. The Dutch brought the initial Arabica beans into the country in 1696, exporting its first shipment in 1711. The profitability of the product led to an increased focus in production, one that continues to this day. Indonesia is among the top five coffee producers in the world. However, the process of growing and cultivating the crop, including of course the importation of non-native coffee plants, 
meant profitability could only come through increased volumes of product. Not only that, the Dutch colonial government enforced a policy called Kulturstressel, the cultivation system. Especially rampant in Java, this system replaced land taxes with forced farming. 20% of a village's land had to be devoted to government crops intended for export. An alternative required peasants to work for the government farm 60 days out of the year. Either way you slice it, they were slaves to Dutch colonizers, unable to roam from their villages without permission, prevented from cultivating enough land to grow their own crops for food, and prohibited from even sampling the very coffee they were forced to grow. The farmers found a way around it – Asian palm civets. Civets are all over South and Southeast Asia, and they've been there since the Pleistocene era. They're solitary, mostly nocturnal, and they won't even come out if the moon is too bright. In fact, little of their behavior has actually been witnessed except for their diet. Mango, palm, flower sap, rambutan – it's all fair game to the civet. In places like Sri Lanka, their constant raids on fruit farms have given them a reputation as pests to be exterminated. Though whatever efforts have been made in that regard, they are still classified as least concerned by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Part of the reason for that is their adaptability to their habitat. Another part is their longevity combined with the expanse of their domain. But some speculate that what's really keeping them alive is their usefulness to the coffee trade. See, among the fruits civets love are the cherries from the Arabica and Robusta coffee plants brought to Indonesia from Ethiopia and Yemen. The civets are a discerning bunch. They leave the unripened fruit alone, preferring to devour the deep red cherries, known for a flavor that's either sweet like watermelon-raspberry combo or floral like jasmine. They come out at night, they eat the cherries from the coffee plants, they digest the fruit, and they poop. And in that poop, coffee beans, undigested coffee beans. Beans that were still left whole, so that the enterprising farmer who found them could take them out of the dung, wash them, roast them, and make a cup of coffee from them. This became an Indonesian farmer's secret. It proved to be a good one to have. While painstaking in its collection, the beans yielded a coffee with a one-of-a-kind flavor. First of all, the civet's pickiness meant that only the best beans were being cultivated. Secondly, the digestive process made for a unique filtering system. Proteins that usually affect flavor and aroma were instead broken down in the civet's stomach, while levels of acidity were lowered and the amount of caffeine decreased. The farmers considered the new beverage a better-tasting, better-smelling alternative to the enforced product. They called it Kopi Luwak, literally civet coffee. So, what's the actual process? Simple, just go out in the jungle in the after-dawn mist, after the civets have retired, find a pile of their poop studded with coffee beans. Actually, let's be realistic, you want several piles of poo. It could take hours, but it's easy to spot. Again, the beans really do not digest. Collect the piles with the help of a banana leaf or other natural parcel. Bring it back to the farm for proper cleaning. That means pouring the morning's finds across a sifter, hopefully wearing a protective garment over your hand and, well, sifting. Get all the poop and dirt and other luwak trash, as the farmers call it, out of the beans. Sort through the beans left over so that only the perfect specimens survive. Wash thoroughly with water and allow them to dry in the sun. Modern farmers actually rake the piles into large tracks of beans for a thorough dry. The dry beans are then returned to the sifter for pairing with a hard brush, making sure to peel the outer shell away to get the desired bean within. Any remaining skin is removed, the beans are sorted by hand. Eventually, the Dutch plantation owners got wind of this bootleg java. That is, if not the source, they at least knew the farmers were making their own coffee in secret. Rather than risk being accused of stealing from their oppressors, the Indonesian farmers let them in on a secret, teaching the colonizers how to harvest and make a cup of kopi luwak. It was a hit. The Dutch liked the flavor, admired the ingenuity, and most importantly noted that the limited supply meant a significant markup in price. What was once a desperate attempt by exploited farmers to maintain some individual income became a gourmet commodity. So, who brought kopi luwak into the modern mainstream? National Geographic first wrote about it, albeit briefly, in 1981. Coffee consultant and author Tony Wilde is credited by many, including himself, with bringing it into the popular consciousness in 1991. He read the National Geographic article and it inspired him to import a sample of the product over to the UK. A media blitz ensued, making Kopi Luwak, Tony Wilde, and the firm he worked for, tea company Taylors of Harrogate, famous. Briefly, at the very least. More recent writings about Kopi Luwak credit the 2007 film The Bucket List with revitalizing the clamor for fertilized beans. It's the preferred beverage of the billionaire played by Jack Nicholson. Who wouldn't want to live like billionaire Jack? Whatever happened, the demand for Kopi Luwak increased. 
partly for that famously unique flavor and smoothness, partly for the novelty of drinking something made from poop. And like anything big business and mass production gets their hands on, prices have gone up, quality has gone down, and the source has been grossly misused and abused. Remember, the civets are solitary nocturnal creatures. They come out at night and eat and disappear into the night. Most of the time, all you see of them is their poop. And going out into the wild, locating and gathering enough droppings from which to harvest enough coffee beans to make even a cup is time-consuming. Even though everyone agrees it's the best way to make a satisfying cup of Kopi Luwak, but big businesses don't have that kind of time to keep up with the demand. And so some plantations have created civet farms. Basically, it's this, civets in cages, with nothing to eat except a bowl full of coffee cherries. On a pure coffee-making level, this has compromised the quality of the product. Civets in the wild are picky. The farmers filling the bowls for caged civets are not. But what about the actual civets? In 2016, conservationists assessed the living conditions of civets on 16 coffee plantations in Bali. Here's what they found. Civets living in cages that were sometimes too small for them to comfortably move around in. Floors made of wire mesh with no other padding or covering to relieve discomfort. Cages left unclean, forcing the animals to stay in their own urine and feces. Civets kept together or else with their cages stacked against each other. A nightmare for an animal that prefers solitude. Some are kept on a strict diet of coffee cherries, meaning they're not getting nutrients from other foods they'd eat in the wild, such as insects and reptiles. This can lead to malnourishment. If they refuse, they're sometimes force-fed the cherries by farmers. And of course, their cat-like appearance has made them a spectacle for tourists, keeping the nocturnal surrounded by constant noise and activity during the day, stressing them and disrupting their sleep cycle. There have been reports of fur loss, aggressive behavior, and high mortality rates. And it's not like you can just buy from a more ethical brand, either. Organizations like the Rainforest Alliance, which works to ensure standards of sustainability in agriculture, refuse to certify any Kopi Luwak, since it's difficult to confirm what's been harvested from wild poop and what's come from caged animals. It doesn't help, of course, that a lot of companies falsely label their products in order to maintain the legend of scat found in the forest. Tony Wilde himself even stated that the coffee companies selling Kopi Luwak grossly and purposely understate the amount they harvest in a year, so as to bolster the coffee's reputation as a rare, hard-to-make novelty. And yet, even by that token, other coffee know-it-alls claim there are more pounds of Kopi Luwak sold than actually made. That is to say, fraud is rampant in the Kopi Luwak trade. The man known for bringing the most unusual cup of coffee such widespread attention that it became the most expensive cup of coffee now calls it, and this is a direct quote from a piece he wrote for The Guardian, a grotesque cancer that constantly mutates into yet more vile and virulent forms. By more vile and virulent forms, we assume he's talking about the variants. Yes, there is a whole variety of coffee harvested from beans either spat or sat on by animals, and in Brazil, a small biodynamic plantation found that its coffee cherry plants were being picked clean with the arrival of the endangered jacu bird. Rather than try to stop them, the owner shifted to picking the coffee beans out of the bird poop and made his own version of Kopi Luwak. They even keep the membrane from peeled beans to make a special tea. In Peru, Uchinari coffee is made using beans collected from the scat left behind by coatis, in a process that sounds almost identical to the Kopi Luwak tradition. In Thailand, the Black Ivory Coffee Company operates through an elephant sanctuary. They feed their family of pachyderm coffee cherries mixed in whatever else they enjoy – bananas, tamarind, whatever the individual elephant prefers – finding their source in the droppings left three days later. And as if poop isn't enough, there's also monkey spit coffee in India and Taiwan. Just as it sounds, the harvest comes from the beans spat out by macaws and Reese's monkeys who just want the fruit of the coffee cherry. So, is it all worth it? Those who swear by the unique coffee to claim their lack of bitterness they also praise these natural flavors and aromas brought to the beans by their natural diets of the animals. It's said that a Jaku bird coffee tends to have natural cinnamon notes, and Black Ivory Coffee says their Thai elephant brand may contain chocolate or even leathery flavors. Critics of the coffee say otherwise. Within the realm of international coffee connoisseurs, Kopi Luwak and his ilk are generally sniffed at. Yeah, they may be less bitter, but bitterness is part of coffee's appeal. Whatever flavors they may possess are extremely mild, if not outright bad. And besides all that, it's an extremely prohibitive cost with very little value for your money. Consumers who can afford it are paying $100 a cup for weak sludge and the opportunity to tell their friends that they drink poop. Science is weird, and sometimes in order to make a breakthrough, you just gotta get weird right along with it. Today we're looking at the top 10 weirdest scientific studies ever conducted. Number 10. Shot, shot, shots. 2006 was a simpler time. 
and it would still be three years until LMFAO released their iconic party anthem, Shots. Yet science was well ahead of LMFAO, as researchers plied subjects with large amounts of alcohol in the name of scientific research. The aim of the study was to see how badly talking on a cell phone impaired a person's ability to drive. Naturally, they compared it with how badly drinking heavily impaired a person. But first, they'd have to get their data, which meant getting 40 people good and sloppy drunk. First, they put participants in front of a driving simulator completely sober and without a phone in their hands. Unsurprisingly, most people did pretty well avoiding accidents or fender benders. Next, they put those same drivers back in front of the wheel, but this time, they gave them a phone and had them carry on a conversation. Finally, scientists plied a new group of drivers with alcohol until they were legally drunk and put them back in front of the same driving simulator. The results were shocking. Data showed that drivers carrying on a conversation on a phone, even when it was hands-free, were as prone to getting in an accident as the drunk drivers showing that driving while yapping on a cell phone was as bad as driving drunk. Perhaps the most surprising revelation, however, was that hands-free cell phone use was as bad as regular phone use. Number 9. Poop Knives Being a scientist can be a tough job, especially when you spend half your time pleading and begging for funding to fuel your next brilliant breakthrough. It probably doesn't make any scientists in our audience feel better than to hear about our next fully funded scientific study to disprove a native Inuit urban legend. For years, a story circulated through academic and popular literature of an Inuit man whose family asked him to move into their settlement. The stubborn old man refused, so to encourage him, the family took away all of his tools and left him in his igloo out on the ice. Stubborn to his core, the man instead shrugged, walked outside into the freezing temperatures, and dropped the deuce. Once his captain's log was hard as ice, he carved it into a knife using his hands and his spit, and then used the knife to butcher a dog for its meat used its ribcage as a sled and its hide as a harness, which he attached to another dog and simply rode off into the dark winter night, sort of like some sort of crappy Santa. For some reason we cannot possibly fathom, scientists took issue with this story and set out to prove or disprove it. For eight days, a team of researchers adopted an Inuit diet for authenticity of their building materials, and then froze their bottom brownies before carving them into blades. Using a pig carcass, the team attempted to slice and butcher the dead animal. Unsurprisingly, the human dookie blades did nothing but leave brown streaks on the hide of the dead pig. Next time you're looking for a job, try and remember that someone got paid a lot of money to find out human poop knives don't work. Number 8. Good Intentions and the Ear Mites This next story hits a little close to home since we had our own lab rat and resident challenge expert once infest himself with lice to try out various treatment options. You can find that little internet gem in our episode, So I Gave Myself Lice, and this happened. However, we were pretty sure of the outcome. It seems veterinarian Dr. Robert Lopez needed proof that bugs are in fact transmissible between animals and humans. For his study, Dr. Lopez set out to see if ear mites could be transmitted from a cat's ear to a human ear. He wasn't able to find the answer in any medical literature and was concerned about a woman's child who slept with a cat suffering from ear mites. So he sacrificed himself on the altar of science by infesting his left ear with ear mites from the affected cat. Sure enough, he developed an ear infection severe enough to limit his hearing. To verify his results, he repeated the experiment two more times. Don't worry though, Dr. Lopez wasn't done yet, and subsequent experiments saw him infect himself with ringworms, pinworms, and roundworms, which gives us a lot of ideas for new challenge episodes. Number 7. Octopuses on E Listen, we tried hard to think of a better title for this next experiment, but sometimes you can't do better than real life. Octopuses are strange creatures, so strange in fact that some scientists have even hypothesized they may not be part of the same tree of life as the rest of Earth. That's right, octopuses are alien enough to maybe actually be alien. While this next study didn't prove or disprove that octopuses are alien, it did prove at least that there is a strong chance we come from different branches of the same tree of life. Scientists wanted to know if the same serotonin transporter is present in both humans and octopuses, so to test this fact, they needed to fire up that serotonin and see what happened. And what better way to get the serotonin flowing than with heavy use of drugs? Scientists drove their octopuses to Burning Man and doped them up on ecstasy. Fine, they did it in a controlled lab environment, but rest assured those octopuses were rolling hard. Ecstasy just so happens to bind to a specific gene which researchers could observe to verify their conclusions, and unsurprisingly the octopuses who were tripping hard at this point started becoming even more social and a lot more touchy-feely with each other, which anyone who's ever been to Burning Man can confirm is proof octopuses have the same capability to roll on E as humans. Number 6. Everything is awesome, even poop. Another poop study, because for some reason science has yet to plunder all the scientific wealth that poop apparently has to offer. 
Listen, some scientists dedicate their lives to eradicating deadly disease or unlocking space travel, while others push the boundary of human poop knowledge ever bravely forward. Six researchers from the University of Melbourne swallowed a Lego figurine head and then tracked it as it made its way through their body and how long it took to poop it out. Before the experiment, though, the participants measured their, and we're not making this up, stool hardness and transit score, or SHAT, with the dependent variable being the found and retrieved time, or FART. We're the ones who get paid to make poop jokes on the internet, so scientists stay in your lane. Unsurprisingly, the Lego head traveled through their systems with ease. But if you're a University of Melbourne student, you can rest easy knowing your tuition is going to fund some of the most groundbreaking research in human history. Number 5. Dead Man Karate Dead Man Karate sounds like some kind of awesome, mysterious fighting style. But it's not. Instead, it basically is scientists using dead people to punch stuff. Because science. The human hand is weird when you compare it to that of our closest relatives, the apes. We've got shorter palms and fingers but bigger thumbs, and while the common argument is that this improves our dexterity and allows us to master the use of tools, some scientists believe that it was also a natural adaptation that allowed us to develop the punch as a fighting technique. Animals, after all, have all kinds of advantages we don't. Teeth, claws, spines, and spikes of all kinds, and our closest relatives basically have superhuman strength. Compared to every other animal out there, humans without tools are just two-legged buffets. However, a punch can really make the difference when you've got no natural weapons. To prove this, scientists hacked off the forearms of eight male cadavers and then rigged them up to a pendulum. The hands were manipulated into a traditional punch and an open-handed strike, with the results showing that a punch with a tight fist delivered over half as much force as a strike with a loose fist. The shape the human fist makes when it's balled up tightly into a punch also helped protect the hand and forearm from damage, proving that while our hand may not have evolved specifically for punching, it's very well suited for it. Number 4. Mosquitoes have good taste in music Mosquitoes are the most dangerous animal in the world, responsible for hundreds of millions of human deaths over the course of history. That's why any study that promises a new weapon against this winged menace is welcome in our book. But this time, the sword is double-edged. It's known that low-frequency vibrations help insects get laid. We're not being crass, that's literally the science. Male and female mosquitoes use the vibrations of each other's wings to find each other and copulate. However, nobody knew what would happen if you set out to disrupt the ability for mosquitoes to sense those vibrations. The scientists then blasted mosquitoes with the Skrillex song, Scary Monsters, and Nice Sprites, watching how mosquitoes reacted. Incredibly, the song seemed to significantly reduce the mosquitoes' appetite for food and sex both, likely because it overwhelmed their sensory organs and messed with their perceptions. The research was carried out as an attempt to find environmentally friendly ways to control mosquito populations. Though we're not sure what's worse, being forced to sit through Skrillex at high volumes or running the risk of catching dengue fever from a swarm of mosquitoes. Number 3. Captain Obvious and the Black Widow 1933 was a heady time for science. Einstein's general theory of relativity had upset classical Newtonian physics. Man was dreaming of taking rockets into space, and the airplane had at last brought mankind so close together that surely war was never possible again. But in the mind of Dr. Alan Walker Blair of the University of Alabama, there were some questions science still needed to settle, such as this superstitious fluff that Black Widow spider bites were truly dangerous. Ain't no overgrown skeeter killer gonna stand in the way of science. So Dr. Blair hollered out, Roll Tide, and shoved his finger right in the Black Widow's face. The results were immediate and completely obvious to any of the millions of country folk who had dealt with Black Widows on their land for hundreds of years. Within two hours, the good doctor's assistant had to take over writing the lab notes, because Dr. Blair was suffering from extreme pain, uncontrolled sweating and vomiting, and severe mental status changes. It took two days for the symptoms to go away and the good doctor to state at last for all science to acknowledge the venom injected by the bite of the adult female spider Latrodectus mactans is dangerously poisonous for man. Then a few years later, an entomologist from the University of Kansas thought to himself, ain't no bog-dwelling bammer boy gonna outscience me, and went and got himself bit too. Number 2. Improving American Healthcare Americans will do literally anything to figure out how to deny healthcare to most of its population, so scientists set about to figure out how to treat kidney stones without actually letting someone see a doctor. After a patient told him that he had dislodged one of his kidney stones at a roller coaster, Professor David Wardinger of Michigan State University College decided to build a replica renal system and take it with him on several coasters. And sure enough, the side-to-side -side motion of being jostled seemed to work kidney stones free. 
Researchers later got wind of this curious find and conducted more rigorous tests, discovering that riding at the back of a roller coaster had an exponentially greater kidney stone passage rate at 23 out of 36 riders than riding at the front at 4 out of 24 riders. So next time you got a kidney stone, buy yourself a day pass to a local theme park, because you can't afford medical treatment anyway. Number 1. Thanks to a totally mysterious and utterly unexplained rise in authoritarianism starting in the year 2016, social scientists have been increasingly curious about how to identify far-right authoritarian tendencies in people and their support for dictators. This time, they linked up with regular old scientists to make a startling discovery. People who are disgusted by body odor are far more likely to support authoritarian policies and figures. The study measured individual social attitudes on a right-wing authoritarianism scale and the responses to the body odor of strangers. Interestingly, those who displayed the greatest disgust at another person's body odor also scored the highest on the right-wing authoritarianism scale. The research concluded that individuals especially sensitive to their chemo-signaling system, a tool for regulating interpersonal contact and disease avoidance, were more prone to fall in line with authoritarian figures, since xenophobic views are so closely aligned with dictatorships. For their research, they used speeches and news reports of Donald Trump, who frequently showed authoritarian tendencies. I was in agony. Absolute, total agony. Around me were hundreds if not thousands of people, all of us intent on being some of the first people to take a ride on Hagrid's Magical Creatures motorbike adventure at Universal's Islands of Adventure theme park. I had seen the sneak preview video, and it looked amazing, like no other ride I'd ever seen. There was no way I was going to drop out of that queue, but the pain, oh my god the pain. I felt as if I was holding on to a rising balloon, and if I just held on a little longer, I could make it. But if my grip failed me, I would fall and die. Well, that's just a metaphor, but in reality, I really was on the verge of death. Let me explain. First of all, you should know that I'm a huge Harry Potter fan, not just a fan of the movies, but the books and everything else related to the magical teen and his band of extraordinary buddies. You're probably thinking that I'm just a kid, but you'd be wrong. I was a kid when the first movies came out, but as some guys on the mean streets sometimes say, once an addict, always an addict. When I heard about the new ride in Orlando, I got in touch with another guy I knew from the Harry Potter fan club Facebook page, and we both agreed we'd try to get in on the inaugural ride. The reason I picked him is because we both live in Florida. I'm in Tampa, and he's in Jacksonville. We wouldn't have to travel too far, so the deal was made. The plan was to get a hotel close to the theme park and the next day wake up well before dawn and start queuing before the crowds came. As you guys all know, you can have the best intentions in the evening and when you get up in the morning, you don't have the same amount of enthusiasm. We were sharing a room and that meant when that alarm clock went off at 3 a.m., we weren't in the best of moods. Maybe those few beers the evening before had been a bad idea. Fortunately, the hotel had a 24-hour cafe, so I sank two double espressos followed by a bottle of water, followed by a mocha frappuccino to go. My friend wasn't into coffee. He said it gave him anxiety, but I can tell you this, soon after I downed those espressos, I was good to go. Since I knew we'd be standing in line for maybe a couple of hours, we bought some stuff from the convenience store and put the food, water, and soft drinks in our backpacks. What was surprising was the fact that when we got to the park around 5 a.m., there was already a stream of people lined up at the entrance to the park, all of them there for Hagrid's Magical Creatures motorbike adventure. No kidding, we even met a guy who'd come all the way from England. The dude was dressed in a wizard's cape and written on it were the words potty for potter. He had to explain to me that potty can mean crazy in the UK. The guy was kinda condescending about having to explain that to me, but I paid it no mind. The guy was potty. There was no doubt about that, flying over the Atlantic for a theme park ride? He told me he'd read in the media that the experience was one of a kind, and the park had spent $300 million on it. He said some of his countrymen traveled the world to watch their stupid football teams lose, so what he was doing wasn't at all that crazy. You mean soccer? I asked genuinely. What did I know? No, he said, shaking his head in disdain. I mean football. Jeez, I thought, I'm going to have to spend the next few hours next to this guy, and I've already upset him. After about an hour, we saw more and more people join the queue. It was hard to say how many because it wrapped around the corner. In front of us, I'd guess there were about three to 400 people. The time was now about 7 a.m., so there was only a couple of hours to wait before the park opened. But the thing was, I needed to pee. I'd only had those small espressos and I'd barely touched my mocha frappuccino, but I still felt those first pangs of pee pain. 
you know, the part where you're not quite sure that if you just hit the release button for a second if something would come out. At 9am we were allowed inside the park and to my surprise no one tried to cut in line. Every single person was directed toward the ride with some of us now inside the theme park and from what I could see a lot of people still in line on the outside. That made me feel quite proud that we made the decision to wake up so early. The sun was now out and I was in a bit of a predicament. I still needed that pee. Well, I needed it more but I was also thirsty. Those beers the night before really had been a bad idea. I decided I'd just take a sip of some Coca-Cola rather than glug down the water. I'd later find out that that decision was a bad one because sweet soft drinks like the coffees I drank are what you'd call diuretics. What are they, you might wonder? Well, the answer is they promote something called diuresis. Ok, so you're still in the dark about this? The simple answer is they make you pee. Pee more than, say, water. Caffeine is the king of diuretics and I just had coffee and coke. I was really holding that pee in at around the 10 am mark, about 5 hours into our queuing. There were some helpful distractions such as videos playing with some amusing words from Hagrid or pictures of the ride itself and the pretty amazing forbidden forest that had been created, but still I was now in pretty serious pain. At around the 6 hour point I was standing cross legged and slightly bent over. This seemed to ease the pain as if I were squeezing the tubes where the urine traveled to meet its final destination. What I would later find out after a bit of research was that at that point I was in danger of weakening my bladder muscles, something which could harm my bladder for the rest of my life. In hindsight, that was the least of my worries. Sure, we were getting close to the ride, I hoped, and I just stood there looking like a man who was slightly demented or had recently been in an accident. My buddy had done the right thing and had just been taking small sips of the water. But to be honest, in his excitement I really don't think he was that concerned about my predicament. I'd also later find out that the parts of my body that were helping me keep in the pee, now probably a tsunami waiting to happen are called the urethral cylindrical sphincters. These are great when you tighten them for a short while such as when you don't want a puddle of pee beneath you on a busy bus, but they're brakes, not doors. They can be worn out. At the 7 hour mark I couldn't overstate how much agony I was in. I knew we were getting close to the ride, so I held on for dear life. That British guy heard me telling my buddy that I thought I was about to pee myself. My friend laughed, but I can tell you it wasn't funny to me. My buddy said that if it was that bad just go find a bathroom and he'd hold my spot in the queue and you won't believe what happened next. That British guy overheard this and said in no uncertain terms that if I left the queue then I'd have to start from the back. He said he also needed a pee but in Britain he said there's a thing called queuing etiquette. I think that this guy thought he was special just because Harry Potter is British. That or he was just a xenophobic snob. I can recall his exact words. He said the reason we have queuing etiquette is because if we didn't then there'd be chaos. Queuing chaos doesn't work, he said, and then he went about a time in the past he had difficulty buying a train ticket in India and how he'd almost gotten into a fight at a buffet when hordes of hungry Chinese people fought over the shrimp. He said he wasn't picking on me, only that if order broke down then order would cease to exist. Formal and orderly queuing, he said, in a patronizing way, is the mark of a civilized man. What a total jerk. He told me that if I left the line he'd make a complaint and say I'd cut in line. What I really couldn't believe is that the other people in the line didn't get my back, so I guess one less man in the line was good for them so they just kept quiet. The words that went through my head were the milk of human kindness and then I wished I hadn't thought about milk, gallons of it pouring over pristine porcelain mountains. At that moment my urethral sphincters almost called it quits. I'll fill you in later but I'll tell you that I'd already caused myself some damage. I was at about the 9 hour point, then we were very close to the ride entrance. I'd almost made it, but the problem now was the excitement I felt almost made me lose concentration and loosen those muscles and let all the urine flood out. I had to concentrate, keep the door locked I kept saying to myself. Everyone was laughing and joking, taking selfies and looking in awe at the ride we were about to go on and I was undoubtedly the only man in that queue who did not have a smile on his face. If anything I grimaced, a kind of agonized grimace, like someone who just won the lottery and then been told they only have a week to live. We finally got in the castle but to be honest I was in no mood for taking photos. I was hardly even aware at this point if I was actually holding a pee in. It was like I'd gone into survival mode. 
It felt like my urine had become a hardened prisoner, my entire body was now some kind of detainment unit. That ride itself consisted of Hagrid's motorcycle with a sidecar next to it. I told my buddy that in the interests of me holding the pee, it might be best if I took the bike and he took the sidecar. It was all about control, you see, I needed to feel in control. That British guy was right behind me on the other bike, something he'd regret to this day. At something like 50 miles an hour, we drove past Fluffy the Three-Headed Dog and other such things as Cornish Pixies and a Centaur. I didn't really care. I just wanted the experience to be over as quickly as possible. This was turning out to be one of the most painful and pointless days of my life, and there would be consequences to come. I thought I had it under control, even on the biggest descents and through the sharp bends, but then there was a surprise drop and the heavens burst. The tsunami came. My bladder roared as its doors were kicked down by a violent torrent of urine. My pecker must have been flailing around like an out of control fire hose. Hours of backed up urine gushing from its spout like a great yellow geyser. The pee was everywhere, and it stunk. It was old pee, neglected pee. And when it ejected from me, it spread far and wide. I looked behind me and saw that British guy wincing, looking utterly disgusted. His eyes were glaring into mine. Was I embarrassed, you might ask? No, is the answer. I was relieved, incredibly relieved and almost ecstatic that my British foe had tasted the vapors of an agony he had been an accomplice in creating. I know guys, maybe I shouldn't have felt so overjoyed that someone had to experience great wafts of urine vapor in their face, but you know what? I paid for it. I soon got my karma. When I finally got back to Tampa after a pretty awkward farewell with my Harry Potter fanboy buddy, I felt a stinging pain every time I went to the bathroom to pee. After seeing a doctor, I was told I had a urinary tract infection. That could be cured, he said, and he told me he couldn't believe I'd done a 10-hour urine hole. If there are records, he said, I might have broken some. The bad news, though, was that he said the damage done could be irreversible. He told me that long-term bladder stretching could make it hard for me to pee in the future, and one day if I kept doing this kind of thing, I might have to put a catheter into my member and draw the urine out. On the other hand, all that stress on my bladder could lead to incontinence, so holding in even normal pees would be impossible. I had some blood checks and my kidneys were functioning normally, but he said, when you do anything as crazy as I did, kidney damage can occur, as can the appearance of kidney stones. Just don't make a habit of enduring those marathons, he said. A few minutes is fine, but holding it for hours isn't good for you at all. The one thing he said that really scared me is when he told me that the bladder can actually burst when you hold in a pee as long as I did. He said it was very rare, but it had happened. When it does happen, you can actually die. He told me not to worry though, because the cases he'd heard about all happened to people who already had compromised bladders. He said, like what happened to me, before the bladder bursts, people will just pee themselves. He said cases of healthy bladders just bursting are so rare that he doubted that it could have happened to me. But in the few cases it has happened, urine leaked into the abdomen, and when people didn't get straight to the emergency room, they died. The punchline to this story is that I could have actually told one of the attendants at the park that I needed the bathroom and gotten the green light to go, and he would have made sure I got right back into the queue despite what that British guy might have said about that. We've all been there. You feel the urge to pee and start to make your way to the bathroom, and as soon as that shiny porcelain bowl is in sight, though it's like your bladder goes on overdrive and you suddenly feel like you're about to burst. You gotta get unzipped and on that toilet quick or you're gonna start redecorating the bathroom walls with lemonade. But why in the world do you have to pee more the closer you get to the bathroom? For some people, this can be a very serious issue, known as latchkey incontinence. The phenomenon typically occurs when an individual suffering from an overactive bladder returns home from work or running errands. As soon as they press that garage door opener or stick the key in the lock, the bladder seems to release the floodgates. Suddenly, it's like the bursting of China's Bangkau Reservoir Dam. Only instead of killing 171,000 people, the only casualties are your pants and the entryway rug. Other people who don't suffer from incontinence or overactive bladder, however, still often feel the same sudden and desperate urge to pee as soon as they spot the bathroom door. Scientists are actually unsure as to the cause of this phenomenon, though they believe that it might be due to psychological conditioning. In the 1890s, Russian psychologist Ivan Pavlov was researching salivation in dogs in response to being fed. His initial hypothesis was the dogs would begin to salivate as soon as the food was placed in front of them. However, he quickly noticed that the dogs instead began to salivate when they heard the footsteps of the assistant responsible for bringing their food. Pavlov used this realization to attempt to condition the dogs to salivate, a completely uncontrolled response on their behalf, without any food being present. First, Pavlov exposed the dogs to a metronome, 
which elicited no response except for a few confused looks, as expected. However, Pavlov then began to expose the dogs to the metronome right before giving the dogs their meal. Soon, the dogs began to salivate upon hearing the metronome even without food being presented. Pavlov had unlocked a very important learning technique known as the conditioned response, and his dogs were lucky to be involved in Pavlov's experiments rather than later Russian experiments where dog heads would be transplanted onto different bodies. You can probably already see the threads of this conclusion coming together. Unless you're from Alabama, you were taught from an early age that the bathroom is the place to do your business. It didn't matter if the bathroom was at home or at the movie theater or your workplace, the bathroom is the one and only acceptable place to do your business. Now your brain is so conditioned to associating the bathroom with making lemonade or dropping kids off at the pool that while the conditioning is not strong enough to force you to have to pee, it is enough to make it unbearable if you already have to pee. Sadly, for most people who use public bathrooms, the association between the actual toilet and you doing your business isn't as powerful as the association with the bathroom itself. That explains why when you use a busy public restroom, the stalls tend to look like someone had a urine super soaker fight in there. And kids, if you're playing urine super soaker, then take it from us. There's no winners, only losers. People with severe incontinence or overactive bladders, however, can find this situation unbearable, and the condition only gets worse with age. That's why doctors may sometimes prescribe medications that can help control the nerves of the bladder, or in extreme cases, may physically enlarge the bladder itself so as to relieve the pressure and need to urinate long enough to actually get to the toilet. For the rest of you, rest assured that while you might have a Superman-like control of your bladder today, as you age, that control erodes slowly but surely, and one day you too will be leaking like a bad faucet upon the side of a bathroom door. While we're on the subject though, what if you aren't having trouble holding your pee, but rather having issues with getting it out, especially in a public restroom? Known as pyuresis or shy bladder, the psychological condition affects a person's ability to urinate around other people. For men, the condition is especially troublesome, as men's restrooms typically have rows of urinals placed closely together, only making it more difficult to pee. The only option for most sufferers is either to hold it or lock oneself in a stall, something that's far easier for women to do than men in busy public restrooms. The underlying causes of shy bladder are purely psychological in nature and the condition is considered a form of social anxiety. While the origin can have different causes, the main causes are criticism during potty training, being bullied as a child in a restroom, or sexual abuse. To make matters worse, the condition is self-reinforcing, only becoming stronger each time you try to urinate and can't. As your anxiety grows, your body floods the nervous system with adrenaline. This is typically a good thing, as adrenaline can make you stronger and faster in a fight to the death with a saber-toothed tiger like our ancestors might have found themselves in. Unfortunately, all this adrenaline also freezes up the muscles that allow you to pee, which has the convenient side effect of keeping you from peeing all over yourself in the middle of a fight. Then again, we wouldn't want to fight a urine-wielding warrior, so maybe evolution should take a second look at the urine defense. People with shy bladders can have three main triggers. The first and most common is a lack of privacy. If a shy peer can't find some privacy, they might find their bladder freezing up, even if just moments ago they were ready to flow like the Yellow River in China. The fact that men's bathroom stalls don't always have doors or walls, if you live in some countries that haven't mastered not pooping in holes technology, it's thought of being a big reason why shy bladder is more common in men than women. Who is in the bathroom with you can also be a trigger. You might be just fine peeing in the restroom at a Colorado Rockies game, though that's probably because the bathroom and the stadium will be empty because the Rockies are a terrible team. However, if you actually go watch a good baseball team play and use their bathroom facilities, you might find yourself freezing up when you notice a stranger in the bathroom that reminds you of that stepdad that never hugged you and was always overly critical of everything you did. For individuals with this trigger, it's typically certain individuals or types of individuals who can trigger their shy bladder. Emotions are also a major trigger, especially in public restrooms. The feeling of needing to hurry up because of the pressing throng of people waiting their turn at a public restroom can cause you to embarrassingly freeze up. Even just bringing your own emotional baggage into the bathroom with you can make it difficult to pee though, with anxiety, anger, or fear all working to psychologically block you from weeing. Luckily, there's treatments available in the form of cognitive behavioral therapy. If affected by a shy bladder, you can gradually overcome it by slowly being exposed to your specific trigger. Over time, your brain's anxiety response will get put in check, and before you know it, you'll be whizzing with the best of them in the most crowded of restrooms. However, you can physically hack your body into urinating even when you don't want to, or at least help it. 
The first technique is to take a moment to relax as you're at the urinal or on the toilet for the ladies with shy bladders. Then reach behind you with one hand and lightly tickle the top of your buttocks, right around where the two cheeks split. For most people, the tickling sensation can relax the bladder and facilitate the flow of pee. For the men, the second technique involves lightly tickling the tip of the penis by rubbing it slightly in a circular motion against the tip of the palm. Presto, you should be flowing as free as a river in no time. Why these techniques work is because the muscles that control urination are intricately connected to your nervous system and thus easily hijacked. All it takes is some light pressure or a tickle and your bladder will open up in no time. We just recommend you do this inside the privacy of a bathroom stall so you don't get extremely weird looks. Can you imagine this scene? You visit your friend at his house and he asks you if you'd like a drink. You reply, yeah, thanks, do you have any orange juice? He replies in the positive and comes back with your drink as well as a glass of his own that looks something like apple juice. What's that, you ask? To which he responds, it's my own urine. Perhaps you're not up to speed with the latest trends, you wonder, or has he just gone crazy? It's healthy, he says after seeing how awkward you look. You say nothing but feel pretty sure that drinking your own waste cannot be healthy. Well, today let's have a look at the topic of urine drinking. So, there's a term for it and that term is urophagia. The euro part of the word means urine and the phagia part means to swallow. We should say that today we're not going to talk about urophagia as a paraphilia, meaning something that gives someone sexual arousal. Sorry folks, but that's not why we're here today. Neither are we going to discuss people who drink their own urine as a last resort to survive when there are no other liquids available to drink. What we are going to discuss is people doing this because they think it's good for them. As you'll see, this is quite a controversial topic. So when we're talking about it in this respect, people may refer to the practice as urine therapy and this might be classified as an alternative kind of medicine. It's been around in many cultures for a long time, but it was popularized in the Western culture in the early 20th century by a guy named John W. Armstrong. He was what's called a naturopath. That term itself is controversial because it means healing with natural concoctions and remedies, but some call it pseudoscience. Whatever the case, this man promoted the use of urine for things like stings and toothaches and it said he believed in something he read in the Bible which went, drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. He wrote a book about urine therapy and at the start of that book you can read, the therapy outlined in this book is an entirely drugless system of healing. Moreover, the only ingredient is a substance manufactured in the body, rich in mineral salts, hormones, and other vital substances, namely human urine. He wrote in that book that drinking your own wee-wee can help people if they have a cold or the flu, but he listed all these other ailments and conditions including cancer, jaundice, gangrene, anemia, psoriasis, diphtheria, Bright's disease, heart disease, kidney failure, malaria, menstrual pain, colitis, obesity, syphilis, hair loss, cataracts, asthma, glaucoma, rheumatism, and arthritis. It's said that Mr. Armstrong prescribed urine therapy to thousands of his patients and when he got very sick himself, he believed the best course of action was a 45-day fast with nothing but water and his own urine to drink. Apparently he got better. But before we look at what modern science says about this, let's look at other urine drinkers of the world and why they do it. You might also want to know what's in urine that makes it so special to some people. Well, the answer is that it's 95% water. It might also contain sodium, potassium, urea, chloride, creatinine, as well as other dissolved ions and inorganic and organic compounds according to one science website. But it might contain much more according to other researchers that spent a long time looking at people's urine. It can be normal, abnormal, and if abnormal, it might mean that the person is sick such as he has an infection or some kidney damage. But that's not really the topic of the show today. Back to the proponents of urine drinking. We found some articles online that told us that the practice of urine drinking happens quite a bit in India, maybe more so than in other countries. In 2015, a news story told us that some people there were drinking cow urine because of the alleged health benefits. While some well-known people in India throughout the years have come out and said cow urine or human urine is good for health. We read this in an article in Quartz. The world's first conference on urine therapy was held in Goa in 1996 and attended by around 100 people. The largest delegation from a country outside of India was Germany, which had 28 practitioners. But then we found other stories from around the world, such as the China Urine Therapy Association stating that urine was indeed a miracle cure for many ailments and it might enhance longevity. 
It was back in 2014, but the South China Morning Post reported that there were about 100,000 urine drinkers on the mainland. That's not so many when you consider the population there, but it's not a handful either. One man said in an interview, In these 22 years of urine therapy, I never caught a cold. My eyesight has become clearer and I don't have any age pigment. In 2019 in Thailand, the health minister said to the public, Body wastes must not be eaten or drunk as she pleaded with some ties to end their urine drinking craze. This came after stories online showed some people washing their faces with urine and drinking the stuff. The Thai Department of Health said this should stop. One Thai doctor said, if there's any benefit in urine, it would be a minimal amount of minerals that the body can't cope with. Some people in Thailand might have seen the Facebook posts of 2019 of a man who claims he's never sick and that's because he chugs his own waste fluid. When reporters went to see him, there were bottles of the stuff everywhere and he told them that after seeing a certain doctor, he'd been advised to take the plunge and start the course of urotherapy. One news wrote, apart from drinking it, he applies it to his eyes, ears, and nose, and even showers and washes his hair with it. His wife and children don't use it apart from occasionally using it as an antiseptic, but they don't condemn him for his beliefs. So who's right here, this man or the health minister? Could some pee drinkers in India be wrong? Could those urine imbibers in China be wrong? We found some famous people who drank their own urine too, including the boxer who became world champion in four weight classes, Juan Manuel Marquez. He once said, This is something I've been doing for the past six or seven fights, and it has given me good results. There are also MMA fighters who have done it and pro football players. Brazilian MMA fighter Leota Machida once said in an interview, My father does that for a long time and bring it to us. People think it's a joke. I never said it in the United States because I don't know how the fans will react. I drink my urine every morning like a natural medicine. Are all these people wrong? Is their urine doing nothing for them or maybe perhaps acting as a placebo and therefore helping them? Well, there are plenty of skeptics and like the Thai minister, you'll find many, many people saying the same thing. It has no health benefits. One doctor told The Guardian that urine does contain 95% water, so yes, in an emergency it might be the right spring to tap. But he said the 5% left is the waste the body wants to get rid of. He said think about it like drinking ocean water. It's going to dehydrate you and do significantly more harm than good. But if more harm than good, how come some of these heavy drinkers report that they're in great health? To them, rather than hurt them, a glass of pee a day keeps the doctor away. Well, according to most health professionals, drinking your own pee isn't likely going to make you sick. It's likely someone else's pee won't do that either, or else people wouldn't be taking those gilded showers for fun. Warning though, it can contain harmful bacteria, so imbibing another person's could be a bad move. Research has shown though that urine might contain traces of vitamins, hormones, and antibodies, but not in the quantity that would help a person to have great health. Still, people persist in drinking it and believe that those who condemn the practice either don't know what they're talking about or have more selfish and political reasons for not supporting it. Such a group might be the Urine Therapy of Colorado group, who Newsweek wrote about in 2019. Some of those members might tell you it can cure skin diseases or simply cure a stomachache. One guy even said it cured his depression. It might be a case of saying, well, if it works for you, go for it. Although doctors will still tell you that urine drinking is not the best way to treat sickness. Nonetheless, one might ask if urine drinking is any worse than, say, taking a regimen of depression pills that have a long list of moderate and severe side effects. We can imagine what the urine drinkers would say to that. Finally, we go to the US National Institutes of Health, a place where you can find numerous studies on just about anything related to health. One paper we found was titled, The Golden Fountain. Is urine the miracle drug no one told you about? It discussed how the practice of downing a glass of self-made whiz for health benefits has gone on for centuries all over the world. The author of that paper from University College London said, Urine is sterile when it's produced in the kidney, but once it's left the body, it's usually contaminated. She also said, It's not toxic per se. There may be rare situations where the urine is the cleanest liquid at hand to pour over a dirty wound or the only liquid to drink when buried under a collapsed building or lost at sea for days, but most of the time there are better or tastier ways to improve one's health. She just doesn't think it's worth it. And we found other health professionals that said the same. It has no health benefits and there is a risk of it being infected. One other thing that a doctor told the BBC was this, when you drink urine it will eventually come back out again and be much more concentrated, which could lead to gut problems. The kidneys will have to work hard to filter out the excess again putting strain on them. 
So it seems that while there are quite a few people around the world that swear urine drinking is good for them, ultimately the real health professionals are pretty much all in agreement. Don't drink your urine, at least not with the goal of getting any real positive health benefits. We could do an I drank my own urine for a month challenge, but we're not sure if our writer would like the challenge and of course, we don't want him to fall ill. We found some evidence online that in survival situations some people in the US military have drunk their own pee, but the military advises that its personnel not do that. You might have seen Bear Grylls do it on TV, but we looked at what the experts say and they'll tell you that drinking pee will just make you more dehydrated. Bear Grylls just wants to entertain you. We did find one man who managed to filter his pee. He wrote this on a survival website. I tried the filtration method of digging a small hole, urinating in the hole, placing an empty soup can in the middle of the hole, and using saran wrap over the hole to drip some of the water into the center. I got more water from collecting it from my tent tarp in the morning dew. This guy added that his pee didn't exactly taste good. As the Hollywood cliche goes, poised coital, some of us sit back against the headboard, proud of our accomplishment at gratifying our lover, spouse, or one night stand, and then light up a cigarette. How was it for you? Good enough, you surmise, as you take a well-earned drag? Or are you the kind of person to roll over in an instant, perhaps leaving your bedfellow exasperated and hardly ready to catch some Z's? Or perhaps you spare just a moment reposing, and then compose yourself and start again? Do you cuddle up? Have a chat? Talk about deep things? Or even request a favor of your lover? According to research, these are all common. But what happens to our bodies during and after sex? That's what we'll find out today. In this episode of The Infographic Show, what happens to your body while you are having sex? Today we'll talk about what happens to both men and women having heterosexual sex, and when we say sex, we mean intercourse, lovemaking, copulation, fornication, or as the Brits say, having it off. So, let's start with the man. What happens to him? At some point during sex, men reach a point of no return. This is sometimes called ejaculatory inevitability. Pulse rate and blood pressure rise, the sperm leaves him, and his penis has contractions. Now he can return to resting and let his body calm down, which apparently happens faster for men than women. The penis becomes flaccid, and most men will have to wait some time before they can go at it again, but it all depends on age, fitness, and of course the urge to return to the hearth of passion. Some guys at this point will just want to go to sleep. Is this plain rude, or is it a biological necessity? Well, listen up disgruntled women, science says it's natural for men to want to sleep, and for various reasons. Notwithstanding the obvious, in that it's often nighttime and tiredness might be normal, another reason is because upon reaching orgasm, men release lots of pent up anxiety. So do women, and they might feel tired too, but it seems men sleep more after sex according to research. Another thing is brain chemistry. All these chemicals spill out in the brain when men ejaculate, including serotonin, oxytocin, norepinephrine, vasopressin, and nitric oxide. Some of these chemicals are related to de-stressing and the readiness to sleep. This can lead to that feeling of, phew, and then men want to relax just as they would after any strenuous exercise. It's kind of like getting a hit of morphine, and apparently that hit is much stronger when having sex than when masturbating. One doctor puts it like this when talking about the release of chemicals. They give you a very relaxed feeling, slow down your brainwaves and cerebral functioning, and make you feel pleasantly tired. But it's thought the hormone that is released called prolactin is the main reason men want to sleep. It gives you satisfaction, and the less of it you have, the more likely you will go for round two quicker. Really satisfied men may just turn over and start to snore. Another thing is, is that he might want to go for a pee. The reason? It's chemicals again. Oxytocin and prolactin affect the kidneys, and this makes him run off to the bathroom. Some experts also think it's to clean the urethra from bacteria, a kind of natural need. It might also just be because he's been holding it in during all that messing around. He then finds the pee won't come out. That is normal, because for the sperm to come out, your internal sphincter muscle clamps, and this is to close the bladder. This is to stop the semen from entering the bladder. In a recent article in Cosmopolitan magazine, it was suggested that men who want to cuddle are keepers, but it also says that men who don't might just be succumbing to their own body's demands. You might find that your penis feels a bit sore, but this is just normal after all that contracting. Don't worry, it shouldn't last long. And don't be shocked if your testicles have shrunk, because this is normal too. A doctor talking to Men's Health magazine explained it like this. When you ejaculate, the cremister muscle contracts and brings your testicles up closer to your body, giving you the perception that they're smaller. Lastly, you may get a cramp in the toe. Apparently this happens a lot, but it's just because orgasm causes stimulation in the nerves, especially S1 in the spinal column, and that nerve affects the toes. 
If you look at some research, it also says some men's moods change dramatically after sex, but given the release of all that tension, and all those chemicals flooding out, that's not so surprising. Some men have reported feeling emotionally handicapped after a great orgasm, and that's thought to be because huge amounts of dopamine were released. It's like coming down from a drug that makes you feel happy or ecstatic. In women, the feelings can be similar, as we shall see. So, what about postcoital women? Well, women may not always orgasm. According to an article in Psychology Today, which cited a number of studies, around half of women will regularly orgasm during intercourse, about 20% of women rarely orgasm, 20% consistently orgasm, and 5% never orgasm. When they do, it's different from a man's one great push to the sun, as women have what has been called rapid rhythmic contractions. This can be quite the event, and some women certainly show this in their face, sometimes looking like they've had an ecstatic experience. These shockwaves go through her genitals, her anus, her uterus, and her pelvis, and she too will have a magnificent rush of chemicals flooding through her brain. She may experience female ejaculation, which is when a milky liquid will come out of her urethra. Don't worry women, there's nothing wrong with this. But what about when a lot of liquid comes out? A neurophysiologist from Rutgers University in Newark says it's not the same milky stuff if it comes out in large amounts. In that case, she says, it is urine diluted with substances from the female prostate. Scientists are still not clear as to why some women do this and others don't, but it's certainly not harmful. So, why are women often up for a chat about tomorrow's activities or the meaning of life while some men are already halfway to La La Land? According to a study in the Netherlands undertaken in 2005, women are more focused than men during sex, their minds completely set to the task of reaching orgasm. This is because their amygdala and hippocampus, which regulate feelings, kind of turns off. They are at one with sex, well, at least if they are fully immersed in it. Once we've come, we return to our bodies, our consciousness recalibrates, and our emotional intelligence returns, said an article in Bustle about this phenomenon. But after sex, they switch back. And it's then they get that lovely hit of oxytocin, sometimes called the cuddle chemical. One study found that people with high levels of testosterone release less of this after sex, and men generally have high levels. Some women do too, of course, just not as much. So men, next time you turn over, blame your lack of oxytocin. And women may not experience a refractory period at all. This is the downtime men need to get ready to do it again. Note, teenagers may not need much downtime, but then again, sex doesn't always last that long for these hyper-carnal kids. Women are multi-orgasmic, and they usually could just start again. But be careful there, women, because sex can be more painful for you than it can be for men. Women might cramp up in the uterus, and this is due to the cuddle drug, oxytocin. Let's now call that the double-edged sword chemical. There might also be some burning because of the vaginal tissues getting dry, but lubrication can help. The stinging doesn't mean there is a problem, but obviously if it persists longer than a day or two, it might be something else. And if men see shrinkage, then women see the opposite. In their breasts, at least. Many women's breasts get bigger after sex, and in some women, by as much as 25%. According to Women's Health magazine, just how swollen the breasts become differs from woman to woman. The same article also said a woman's clitoris will become very small at point of orgasm, almost disappearing. At the same time, women's nipples may become more sensitive, but this is very natural. Other reports say some women become giddy after sex, and others feel great confidence, seeing their bodies as much more attractive than before. Most reports we can find state that while some women may experience a slump after the sex, it's the men that really suffer from depression, sometimes a week long. But as the saying goes, what goes up must come down, and most of the time, it's worth the ride. You're born with it, and it'll stay with you for the rest of your life. You look at it every day, and you never get bored of it. It gives you intense pain and gives you immense pleasure. Sometimes when you look in the mirror, you're reminded that it doesn't last forever. You go on Instagram and you compare it with other ones, sometimes hoping you can change it, obscure it, give it a bit of a makeover. But whatever your body looks like, it's a marvel of engineering. It's actually almost difficult to comprehend. In the words of Shakespeare, the human body is unlimited in thinking, admirable in his shape and movement, angelic in action, godlike. Today, you're going to see just how your body is infinitely amazing. You might have heard that women are stronger than men when it comes to surviving disease and also in many other ways. But when it comes to brute force, men on average win hands down. But do you know why that is? It's said that on average, men's upper bodies have much more muscle mass than the average woman, as much as 75% more. Men have stronger lower body strength too. They grip harder, they throw harder, they punch harder, and they run faster. And we'll say this one last time, on average. We've all just accepted this as a fact of life. But what we don't ask is why? 
Why shouldn't women have evolved to be just as strong or stronger than men? Well, scientists say men evolved to fight, men are designed for combat. In some of the natural world, females are very often bigger than males, but that's because they're designed to carry lots of eggs. It's different for land-dwelling vertebrates, which includes humans. Those males evolved to be bigger due to competition with other males regarding finding a female to procreate with. All this fighting over females in the past has led to men being more violent overall. Men are responsible for something like 80% of violent crimes, while the prison population, at least in the US, is made up of 93.2% of men as of April 2021. Are men just naturally violent? It's like this, according to one scientist. Men are not more violent because they're stronger, but stronger because they've needed to be more violent over evolutionary history, which has shaped male psychology in all sorts of ways. So never mind how puny you are, you've been designed to be a fighting machine. But what about the brain? Do men have a different kind of brain? Ok, so we're walking on thin ice even bringing that up. We don't want to offend anyone, so we'll remind you not to shoot the messenger. If you're a scientist and you say that men and women's brains are fundamentally different, you might be accused of neurosexism. But quite a few studies have shown that men's brains work better at completing spatial and motor tasks. They might look at a puzzle and have to think about how a shape can be manipulated to fit it in the right hole. And according to those studies, men will on average be better than women at this. Still, other scientists have called this a myth and indeed a kind of neurosexism. So the jury is still out on that one. One thing we do know for sure is men's brains are bigger, but that doesn't have any effect on intelligence. Men might have bigger parts of the brain for a reason, but again, this is still a controversial issue. Some studies have found that the parts of the men's brains are bigger which are associated with the survival instinct and reacting to stimuli. Women might have bigger parts of the brain that are related to language and emotion. Ok, so now we think we should get down to business and talk about that taboo subject of the male phallus, the penis as your doctor will refer to it. It's a pretty amazing thing to behold, even if it sometimes gets in the way of having a quiet life. First of all, it's a hard worker. It even does the night shift. Did you know that the average man will get 3-5 to five erections during the night, often lasting as long as 30 minutes? What's up with that? It's not as if you need it in your sleep. The medical term for this phenomenon is nocturnal penile tumescence, something we imagine you'd never say to your partner after she asks what that pressure is on her leg. Don't worry darling, it's just nocturnal penile tumescence. Basically, you get wood when your parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated. Sights, touch, memories, even sounds make this happen. Arteries in your pecker dilate, blood flows in and hey presto you got lift off. The penis is not a muscle by the way, it's been described as more like a sponge that gets bigger when it fills with blood. When you're sleeping much of your body might slow down, but the parasympathetic nervous system is still switched on. You aren't getting a stiffy because of dreams and because of that leg of your lover, it's just the fact that your nervous system is functioning well. Why it happens other than that is still a mystery to science. One scientist said nighttime erections serve no purpose whatsoever and are merely a byproduct of the nervous system. So don't worry about it if every time you wake up you feel like you have a Toblerone stuffed into your underwear. Ok, so now to the question you all want answered. Is there such thing as a grower and a shower? Do some men walk around with great big dongs while others walk around with a lip balm in their pants? Well, just remember that a lip balm can almost double in size with a bit of rubbing. There are such things as growers and studies have proven it. If you have a lip balm kind of John Thomas, it's very likely you'll grow a lot more than the guy with a flaccid Toblerone. One study showed that out of 2,770 men with small flaccid willies, their growth was 86% when fully erect. Meanwhile, the bigger boys only showed a growth of 47%. Basically, things even out when men get down to business. As the saying goes, don't judge a book by its cover. Scientists say you cannot assess the size of a man's wiener until you see it in all its glory. Some studies have shown that about 80% of men are growers and the rest are showers. Sticking with subjects that make people blush, you might not know that men have a G-spot. Yep, just tunnel about 2 inches into the rectum and you'll find it there. It's at a place called the perineum between the scrotum and the anus and with a bit of pressure, not too much, it can be activated. It might also be stimulated when you're taking a poo, giving you the feeling of pooforia. There are cases of men having what's been called defecation induced orgasms. Dropping the kids off at the pool can be ecstatic, but usually they'll have to be at least one very big kid. You also might not know that men can produce milk and so can breastfeed. Yeah, that's true. Although the man might have to take some hormonal drugs. In 2002, there was a guy in Sri Lanka who fed his two babies because his wife was dying. He stepped in and saved the day. It usually doesn't happen without any drugs, although certain things can happen in the male body that makes it produce more of the hormone prolactin. One of those things is starvation. When women are pregnant, the levels of prolactin in your body increases, but sometimes it does in men too. Although that's an anomaly, not an evolutionary requirement in nature. Due to hormones, men tend to stink a lot more than women. 
On the other hand, women are better at picking up the scents. According to science, the smell of a man gives women a better idea of who they might be mating with. It's said women find men with high testosterone more attractive and they can sense this with their olfactory sense. Research has shown that single men tend to have higher testosterone levels than men with partners, which makes sense in evolutionary terms. Ok, on to something new, something that might stop men and women arguing about turning up or down the heating in the house. Did you know that men generally feel a little bit warmer than women? You probably do know that, because there's no doubt you've been in a situation where she's cold and you're not. There's a simple reason for this other than what you're wearing. Men generally have more muscle mass and because of that they burn more calories to fuel those muscles. This creates heat, and when heat evaporates it warms the skin. As one doctor puts it, men have their own little heaters. Studies shown that women tend to feel the most comfortable in a room that's slightly hotter than a room men feel the most comfortable in. So don't argue, just accept you're different in this respect. And when it comes to skin, men's skin is anywhere from 20 to 30 percent thicker than the skin of a woman. Men also tend to have firmer skin, which becomes more apparent in older age. This is why women usually get wrinkles before men, and so men often look younger than women as they age. Sorry, women. As one scientist put it, female skin thinning occurs at a significant pace after menopause. Hence, signs of skin aging in older women are generally more pronounced as compared to men in the same age group. Still, there are many factors such as work, stress, and how many days you've been under the sun trying to get a tan or grow some rice. Talking about later in life, men can actually get something that's not unlike PMS. It's called irritable male syndrome, and it usually happens when a man ages and his testosterone levels drop. It might happen at any time in life since testosterone levels do change in men for various reasons. They might suddenly drop and then they might increase, even within one day. When this happens, men might experience fatigue, depression, low self-esteem, anger, anxiety, and moodiness. When it does happen in older age and the levels seem to drop for good, that's called male menopause. Still, with some men, they have a gift that keeps on giving. They can have children at a very late age, even if they might not be the bull on the springs they used to be. In 2010, a guy in India named Mr. Ramajit Raghav had cause to celebrate. He had a child. The strange thing is, he was 94. And get this, he had another child two years later. It's actually not uncommon for men to have kids when they're still in their winter years. The age-defying rubber legs lead singer of the Rolling Stones, Mick Jagger, had his eighth kid when he was 73. A man might have less chance of having a kid at an older age, but he can still produce testosterone and sperm cells even though he might be walking around with a Zimmer frame. Still, as he approaches those winter years, there will be some changes. He might not produce as much sperm as he did before, and those sperm might not be as good at swimming as they used to be. It's usually in the 40s that the quality of sperm takes a hit. Older men might also produce sperm that can lead to abnormalities in the child. No man likes losing his hair, but it's a fact of life that many do. Word on the street is bald men tend to be more sexual, due to what some people have said is the increase in testosterone. But is this a myth or is it true? Firstly, don't worry baldies, when it comes to attraction, studies have shown that there are many more things women think about than the mass of hair on a man's head. Some studies have even shown that bald men are seen as more masculine and attractive to women, but that's debatable. Jason Statham's bald head isn't exactly comparable to a man who has a very unsuccessful comb over. Studies have shown that women tend to be attracted to guys that have shaved all their hair off rather than guys that let hanging curtains decorate their head. As for baldness being related to virility, it's a complex matter. Castrated men who have hardly any testosterone can still have hair, while guys with hardly any hair might have low testosterone levels. Genes are what make their hair fall out, not testosterone. In conclusion, if you're bald, it's your mom and pop's fault, not the fact that you're a super sexual being. What about the Adam's apple? Why do men tend to get bigger ones? The part of the body is made of cartilage and it gets bigger when you hit puberty. Men usually have a larger larynx, an Adam's apple, and that's why they usually have deeper voices. But with both men and women, how large those things grow is down to hormones. Hence, some voices are deeper than others in both men and women. As for why men tend to grow bigger voice boxes in Adam's apples, some scientists say they developed this deeper voice to attract the opposite sex and give off more threatening sound to male rivals. It takes a couple of attempts, but you manage to spark up a lighter and hold it up steadily in front of your face to light up a joint. A familiar woody smell fills the room and drifts out of your window on the afternoon breeze. You blink, steady yourself, inhale deeply, and fill your lungs up with warmth. But what happens next? Chemically speaking, biologically speaking, what is it about this little green plant that gets millions of people around the world to flock to it? How long has humanity been consuming it? And what exactly is it doing inside your body, inside your mind? To start, let's have a look at the chemical composition of the cannabis plant itself rolled up in a joint in your hand. Native to Central and South Asia, the cannabis plant today is so popular, it's now grown to be a global economy of its own. 
from small-scale rural farming operations all the way through to drug super labs, including any number of illegal weed farms somewhere in the middle. Experts believe that there are well over 700 different strains of cannabis currently on the market, and this number seems only set to increase. Being able to identify which strain of weed you have in your hand can be very easy when buying from a legal dispensary, but if you live in a country or a state where marijuana is still criminalized, being able to verify exactly what it is you're smoking becomes more difficult. Looking down at the green mossy balls in your hand, do you know where in the world it's come from and what's inside it? Let's break it down a bit, or rather, grind it down. You've likely heard of the two most well-known active ingredients in cannabis. These are cannabidiol and tetrahydrocannabinol, or as you probably know them, CBD and THC. Over the last 10 years, in the West in particular, CBD has been championed as a potential medical breakthrough. It's also been shown to have a calming effect on those with anxious disorders and is currently being tested as a treatment for psychosis, sleep disorders, muscle spasticity, and more. You might have seen ads for CBD oil products popping up in your feed claiming that it can solve any number of ailments. Research is ongoing, however. Results vary. In the case of curing cancer, for example, so far there's no evidence to support that CBD has any kind of effect on the disease, despite what people on the internet might be saying. So, you smoke CBD to get high, right? No, CBD is usually extracted as an oil, and on its own it will not get you high. But it's still psychoactive, meaning it alters your mental state, typically leaving you feeling more calm and mellow. The feeling of being high comes from the main active component in marijuana, THC. Typically found in much greater quantities than CBD, THC can have a powerful psychoactive effect. To see what that means in practice, let's follow it as it enters the human body. You take in a deep breath of that joint and let the smoke fill your lungs. In this example, you're going to be our test subject, and you will be smoking weed. Smoking is one of the most direct and quickest ways to get high. This is because the smoke from your burning marijuana contains high levels of THC. The smoke is then inhaled, filling your lungs. At this point, you might experience some irritation, manifesting in the iconic smoker's cough, from introducing an alien substance into your lungs. This, however, is not unique to smoking weed as you're likely to see the same from people smoking or vaping conventional tobacco. The lungs are designed to quickly and efficiently transfer oxygen into the bloodstream when we breathe. Therefore, they have the capacity to take in large quantities of gas in one breath and get any number of elements or compounds from that gas into our bloodstream and fast. The lungs aren't just empty chambers, they're full of tiny little air pockets called alveoli. The average human adult has roughly 480 million alveoli in their lungs, constituting about 1,500 miles of airways. That's the equivalent of driving from Miami to New Hampshire for our American viewers, or Madrid to Copenhagen for our European viewers. For everyone else, it's roughly 13,636,363.6 bananas lying end to end. Anyway, back to your lungs. In each alveolus, the THC from the smoke is transferred directly into your bloodstream which then carries it all over your body, including to the critical area, your brain. As a result, it often only takes a matter of seconds for the user to start feeling the psychoactive effects of what they're smoking. So, let's crack your head open and see what's going on inside. Sorry, this might hurt a little. The THC and CBD bind themselves to receptors throughout your brain. The amygdala, for example, is responsible for anxiety, emotional responses, and fear. CBD dulls the activity in this part of the brain, but the THC component can stimulate it. While many users feel calmer after having smoked weed, others can feel a heightened sense of paranoia and worry, particularly on the come down as the calming effects of the CBD wear off. Looking at other parts of the brain impacted by the CBD, we have the basal ganglia, which is involved with motor control and planning, the neocortex, which processes sensory information, and the cerebellum, which is the center of motor control. All three of these areas are impacted by smoking weed, resulting in you feeling slower in general. Reflexes are delayed, information takes more time to process, and motor functions and speech slow down. Driving under the influence of marijuana can be very dangerous as a result. One study in the UK found that fatal accidents are 1.65 times more likely to occur when the subject is under the influence of marijuana, while another study in Canada found that accidents could be to four times as likely. Most countries have strict laws for driving under the influence of weed with zero tolerance policies, made stricter by the fact that it can take over 48 hours for weed to stop showing up on a blood test. If they're testing your saliva, it can be up to 72 hours. Urine can be anywhere from 3 to 30 days, and it can even be tested in your hair follicles for up to 90 days. Fortunately, you won't find many traffic cops that are plucking out your arm hair for a routine traffic stop. 
However, it would be reductive to think that all weed does is dull your brain. THC is a very active component that stimulates a lot of neural activity. Colors look brighter, sounds are louder, music sounds more rich and layered. Food often tastes better under the influence of THC, giving the subject the illusion that they're really hungry. That's right, this is why so many people using cannabis experience the famous munchies, which is why having a stoner visit your home is potentially extremely dangerous to the state of your snack pantry and chip supply. Many people report having heightened imagination, being able to think outside the box or come up with fresh and exciting ideas. Artists all throughout history have partaken in recreational drugs in an attempt to broaden their horizons, dulling a lot of the negative sensations, such as feeling pain and anxiety coupled with the stimulation from THC results in feelings of euphoria. In short, you, our human test subject, have gotten high. But what does this high actually look like? Here's where it gets really interesting. Let's bandage your head up and take a look. So far, we've only focused on the THC and CBD, but there are hundreds of active components within cannabis, which vary in quantity and intensity depending on which of the hundreds of strains the user is consuming. On top of that, there's the method of consumption. While smoking or vaping gets the chemicals into the bloodstream quickly, the high only lasts around three hours or so. Many users instead take gummies or bake brownies and cookies. When weed is absorbed through the digestive system, it takes a significantly longer time to kick in, but when it does, the user can experience highs that go on for hours, even up to a day, as the digestive system slowly releases the chemicals into the bloodstream. All of this makes studying the effects of marijuana very difficult. As with almost any study, there are the caveats of which strain is being used, how the test subject is ingesting it, and who the test subject is. The human brain is an incredibly complex thing indeed. If you took a sample of the human brain that was the size of just one grain of sand, that sample would contain 100,000 neurons and 1 billion synapses. Now multiply that by 860,000 and you've got a human brain, just like the one that's sitting in your head, watching this video and feeling very smug about itself. Being able to quantify and measure exactly what's happening in an organ far more advanced and complicated than the computers we're studying it on has been a challenge in medical science for decades and will likely continue to be one for a very long time. While one individual might take one puff and spend the rest of the day feeling anxious, their elderly grandma might smoke a whole bowl and feel nothing but zen. So for Nana's sake, is it dangerous? Well, on the whole, consuming marijuana is relatively harmless as long as you aren't driving, controlling heavy machinery, or performing open-heart surgery, the risks of smoking the occasional joint with the right amount of weed in it are low. So, why hasn't it been legalized worldwide already? And why are there skeptics out there, including in the scientific community? As is often the case with controversial topics, a lot of the conflict comes from political and cultural differences. To tell that whole story, we need to wind all the way back to China in 2800 BC where we find the first recorded use of marijuana in history. Even that long ago, the cannabis plant was being used for medicinal purposes. Emperor Shen Nong, considered by many to be the grandfather of medicine, recorded the plant in his writings as being particularly useful. From that point, records of cannabis spread throughout India, Syria, Greece, and Rome. Various healing properties have been ascribed to it over the years, including cures for inflammation, depression, arthritis, and even asthma. Of course, most early medicine is notoriously rather unreliable. We're looking at you leeches and milk transfusions. But there's always been something about this little green plant that's captured the attention of doctors and pharmacologists throughout the centuries. Often there's a grain of truth to the mythology that has sprung up around the drug. In Hinduism, for example, the god Shiva is given the title of Lord of Bong because cannabis is his favorite food. For centuries, many Hindus believed that if you were suffering from a fever, it was the god's hot breath of anger upon you. Rituals were conducted where you would be given a quantity of cannabis to consume so you would find favor with Shiva again and your fever would pass. With modern medical science, we know that THC acts in the hypothalamus of the brain, reducing the body's temperature and therefore counteracting fevers. So, where did it all go wrong for Weed's PR team? Why is it that many people in the West now include cannabis in the same conversation as crack, cocaine, and heroin, as opposed to paracetamol and penicillin? Well, medical marijuana was first introduced in the West in 1841 by William Brooke O'Shaughnessy, an Irish physician who spent years studying all kinds of different medicines in India. But the real origins of the USA's problem with marijuana began 200 years before that, in the Jamestown colony in 1605. Dissatisfied with the return on investment they were seeing, the English, and King James I in particular, demanded the colony change up the crop they produced to hemp, a plant within the cannabis family. The crop was a massive success and became the key to the early expansion of the American colonial settlements. 
George Washington himself famously grew hemp as one of his three primary crops on Mount Vernon. The plant was used to manufacture ropes and fabrics, but following William Brooke O'Shaughnessy's findings from India, Americans began to experiment with the plant's medicinal properties. The USA was still in relative infancy, with many laws and prohibitions being established. Drug laws at the time involved labeling products as being poisons, which restricted them to being legal only if prescribed by a pharmacist. Even then, the debate about cannabis varied from state to state, with some issuing it with the poison status and others believing it was exempt from these rules. At the time, opium dens were rife across America, and alongside them a number of hashish parlors popped up in which people would smoke various forms of hemp and cannabis. By 1880, these establishments were seen as quite fashionable, with many of the upper classes frequenting them. It's estimated that there were roughly 500 such parlors in New York City alone. The laws needed to be strengthened further still. Fraud and corruption were rife in the drug industry, with many falsely labeling their products for the sake of profit. The tighter that these restrictions got, the more people looked for loopholes. The government and the newly established Food and Drug Administration were pulling in different directions than a lot of the American public, who were looking to skirt prescriptions and drug laws in order to continue to get their highs. In the move to close the loopholes, cannabis was often grouped in with many of the much more addictive, much more harmful drugs that were plaguing the American population. The solution the American government came to was a zero-tolerance policy on recreational drug use, including the prohibition of alcohol and the criminalization of marijuana, which at the time they were spelling with an H. In 1971, President Nixon coined the term War on Drugs, where he declared drug abuse to be public enemy number one of the American people. The approach was incarceration with an iron fist. Possession, distribution, and consumption of banned substances would result in jail time. It's estimated that throughout this war on drugs, the USA spends roughly $51 billion annually on its endeavor to clean up the streets. To illustrate with that money, the USA could give each Canadian citizen $1,416.67 per year just as a little thank you for being such lovely neighbors. Alternatively, they could give one lucky Canadian a dollar a minute for 97,032 years. A large amount of this campaign against drugs has involved a level of fear-mongering. There's a lot of false information swirling around the world about the negative effects these drugs have. It rots the brain and causes psychosis. It's a gateway drug to stronger and more dangerous highs, and it is highly addictive. But is there any truth to any of these claims? Let's examine them one by one. Firstly, no, marijuana does not rot the brain. Rotting is the decay of dead organic material as bacteria and fungi consume it. That simply doesn't happen. However, the link to psychosis is a much more contested field with evidence for both sides of the argument. Firstly, what is psychosis? It's a term that is thrown around a lot, especially in the world of drug use, but very rarely defined, meaning a lot of people attach their own fears, worries, and prejudices to the word. Psychosis is when someone loses contact with reality. The image of the world around them that the brain is painting doesn't match up with the objective reality surrounding them. The two main symptoms of psychosis are hallucinations and delusions, and it's important to know the difference between the two. A hallucination is when a person experiences something that isn't actually happening. Most commonly, this takes the form of hearing voices that aren't really there or sometimes seeing things that aren't really there. In some cases, people have reported smelling, feeling, and tasting their hallucinations too, such as tasting blood in their mouth despite there being none. A delusion, on the other hand, is more abstract. It could be the feeling that you're being followed or that there's a conspiracy in your workplace to harm you. Delusional people are often highly susceptible to conspiracy theories, as often the paranoid messaging chimes with their fearful delusions that their minds have already been generating. So, does marijuana cause psychosis? It's complicated. Let's go back to the chemicals active in your brain. We're gonna need to crack that skull open again, sorry. THC is highly psychoactive. This is where the feeling of euphoria from being high comes from. While CBD can decrease the levels of panic and paranoia in the brain, it's often present in much smaller quantities than THC, mainly as many cannabis farms compete with one another to grow stronger and stronger strains. Couple that with the fact that there are hundreds of active compounds within the cannabis plant, and it goes back to our earlier point about this being a challenging area of study. Therefore, many scientists rely on quite broad studies, taking large sample sizes of drug users and non-drug users and comparing the development of their brains over time, looking most notably at teenagers and young people. What they found is there is often a link between heavy pot smoking and psychosis. There are cases of people living with schizophrenia 
and bipolar disorders where the heavy use of marijuana is linked to the onset of those symptoms. What has not been proven, however, is that weed was the cause. Most scientists believe that weed can, in some cases, accelerate the development of underlying psychotic disorders. The brain is a very complex and delicate thing. If somebody has an underlying psychotic condition, then the consumption of drugs that alters their state of mind and heightens activities within certain sections of the brain can naturally lead to an exacerbation of those symptoms. Schizophrenia is believed to affect 1 in 300 people, while bipolar disorder affects 1 in 100. While these are quite small percentages, they are not insignificant. THC does carry the risk of triggering a psychotic episode if you're genetically predisposed to having a psychotic condition. The chances are very low and won't affect the majority of the population, but they are still there. Next, is it a gateway drug? The experience of a chemical buzz in the brain is a sensation that many of us try to chase in our lives. You get up and sing in a concert at your high school and you get a rush from it. You do it a second time and the high is worn off a bit. So you need a bigger crowd and a bigger crowd and suddenly you're in a rock band on an arena tour. Chasing this type of bigger, better high is an experience we're sure many of you are familiar with. Studies have shown that in a minority of cases, the same can happen with marijuana. Usage of the drug can prime the brain, ready for more intense highs, which it then craves. This sounds bad until you realize the same thing happens with cigarettes and alcohol. Both of these demonstrate a similar connection to being a gateway drug to harder substances as marijuana. So, why are those not held up to the same level of scrutiny? One thing studies have shown is that there is a much more powerful gateway drug out there, trauma. A difficult childhood, experiencing abuse, and going through acute pain and suffering are all far more likely to result in a person developing a dependence on hard substances. Weed is often a part of that journey, but in these cases it seems to be a symptom more than the cause of the problem. But is it addictive? Let's take a similar look at this question. You wake up one morning feeling tired, so you make yourself a cup of coffee. It clears away the fog, helps you focus on your job, and gives you a little endorphin rush from a good day's work. So the next day, you do the same, and the next, and the next, until one day you run out of coffee. You look in the jar and it's empty. A storm cloud gathers over your head. You go to work with a scowl, snap at your coworkers, have a headache by lunchtime, and come home feeling miserable. What's happened here? Well, the human brain is incredibly flexible. Your brain has gotten so used to the influx of caffeine each day that it's now rebalanced the chemicals inside itself to receive that caffeine boost. It's ready and it's waiting, so when the boost doesn't come, there's now a chemical imbalance. The same thing happens with weed. If you burn one down at 420, smoke weed every day, your brain's going to be sitting there at 419 rubbing its metaphorical hands together in anticipation. Coming off weed now feels hard. You have cravings for it, you feel irritated when you don't have it, you struggle to fall asleep, you lose your appetite, and you generally have a bad time. For about two weeks. Then you're likely back to normal. And that's because what we've described here isn't an addiction, it's dependence. It's very common and can be broken fairly quickly. Up to 30% of weed smokers experience some level of dependence, and it can be overcome by just taking an extended break and giving your brain some rest. That said, there's a small risk of long-term addiction. People under the age of 18 have brains that are still developing. They're still growing and changing and adjusting to the world around them. Smoking weed regularly at this stage in your life could lead your brain to building itself around the expectation that it'll be receiving those chemical hits every day, which may start as a dependence and could grow to be much more deeply rooted and could result in a lifelong addiction. If there's one thing you learned from this video, it's that marijuana, much like life, is complicated. There may not always be a straight answer to every question. Anyone who tells you that something is totally amazing and has no downsides will always be lying. Even ice cream has downsides. What's important is looking at the big picture. Is weed the devil's leaf that spells the end of society as we know it? No, of course not. But neither is it a miracle cure-all drug that everyone should take on a daily basis. Some call it the elixir of the gods, others call it hooch. A fancy cocktail might taste good, but it comes at a price. Your health. Let's find out what the actual benefits are to giving up alcohol. Seconds after you stop drinking, your liver slowly filters out the toxins and sugars found in the alcohol. The molecule ethanol is what makes you feel drunk. It does this by binding to receptors in your brain. Most notably, ethanol binds to glutamate neurotransmitters, which in turn causes the brain to respond slower to stimuli. Along with glutamate neurotransmitters, there are several other receptors that ethanol binds with that slows brain function. 
The result of these inhibited receptors is what we call drunkenness. The reversal of this process can take a while, and the hangover that ensues after a heavy night of drinking is a mix of your body trying to get rid of the ethanol and other harmful molecules, along with dehydration. Unfortunately, if enough ethanol builds up in your system, it can kill you. After about an hour, your body has filtered your blood several times and metabolized the drinks you've had. The time it takes your body to break down the alcohol directly correlates to the amount consumed. About an hour after you stop drinking, your body starts to feel tired due to the high amount of energy it uses to remove the alcohol from your blood. And since it takes about 6 hours for your body to completely break down all the ethanol in your system and bring the sugar, water, and other nutrient levels back to normal, the lingering effects of drunkenness will persist. After you've had your last sip of alcohol, your body needs to rest more than usual to recover from your attempts to poison it. Unfortunately, until you get past this stage, it's difficult to have a good night's sleep. In fact, research suggests that alcohol actually increases alpha wave patterns in your brain, which are only supposed to be present while you're awake. This implies that alcohol tricks the brain into thinking the body is awake when it's really trying to sleep. But there is good news. If you manage to not drink for 6 to 12 hours, your body physically starts to change for the better. For one thing, alcohol has been shown to weaken your immune system. This might leave you susceptible to viruses and bacteria that are present at bars and parties. About 24 hours after you stop drinking, however, your immune system returns to normal. This is the first of many changes that will occur from sobriety. If you're a heavy drinker or an alcoholic, another much more noticeable change to your body will occur around 24 hours after you stop drinking. This is when withdrawal really starts to kick in. Your body may still crave the chemical changes that occur when you drink, and therefore you would start to develop symptoms such as the shakes, cold sweats, increased pulse, nausea, and anxiety. These will eventually pass, but the amount of time these withdrawals last is based on each person and how much alcohol they usually consume on a daily basis. Congratulations! If you make it to 3 to 5 days without drinking, the real benefits of sobriety start to kick in. You may find that your blood pressure begins to drop, and you will overall feel less stressed. Doctors often recommend that people with high blood pressure reduce the amount of alcohol they consume. So even if this is not your goal, less than a week after you stop drinking, your body will be grateful for that much needed break. You also might notice your appetite begins to decrease about a week after you stop consuming alcohol. This is one of the reasons that people tend to lose weight when they quit drinking. The other reason is that on average, each drink you're consuming contains a couple hundred calories. And since the sugars and alcohol don't break down in your body very well, much of it gets stored as fat. If you can give up drinking for an entire week, you may also find your skin looks and feels better. This is because your body is now more hydrated. Not only does alcohol make you pee more often, but it also decreases your antidiuretic hormone levels, which plays a role in allowing your body to reabsorb water. Somewhere around the 7 day mark after you stop drinking, these hormone levels are back to normal and your body is retaining more water. This is good not only for your skin, but for your body overall. Again, it's important to remember that the time between when you stop drinking and start seeing these benefits will vary depending on the person and how much alcohol they previously consumed. A couple of weeks without alcohol, and you might find your cognitive abilities start to improve. This is because the brain, like many parts of your body, is resilient. The damage done to your neural pathway by the ethanol can be reversed. You will never regain memories from when you blacked out while drinking or recover thoughts that were obliterated from overconsumption of alcohol, but many of your neural connections will heal themselves over the coming weeks and months. You'll see even bigger benefits if you quit for more than one or two weeks. Without the pressure of filtering alcohol, your kidneys will begin to repair themselves. Like the liver, the kidneys filter out toxins. They're not quite as affected by alcohol as the liver is, but overconsumption can definitely cause damage over time. After a couple of weeks of no drinking, the kidneys will heal enough to maintain proper fluid levels, waste excretion, and hormone balances. If enough damage is caused to the kidneys from excessive drinking, you will feel much better once they're healed. The organ that takes the brunt of the damage when you drink is the liver. It's a vital structure and without it you can't survive. So about 3 weeks to a month after you completely stop drinking, your liver will begin to thank you. It's around then that the tissue will start to regenerate fully and the liver will repair itself. Without having to worry about alcohol, the liver can focus on breaking down other toxins that are produced by the body, which overall will make you feel healthier. The regeneration of damaged tissue takes time, but it happens much quicker when you stop drinking. A month or two after your last sip of alcohol, your liver will begin working at full power again. Just reducing the amount of alcohol you consume on a weekly basis can be beneficial for your liver. But if you really want to thank this vital organ for all it's done to keep you alive, there is nothing better than giving it a rest from breaking down alcohol. And if liver regeneration wasn't a big enough benefit, there's another major change that will occur to your body after not drinking for around a month or two. I'm sure you've heard that a glass of wine a day can improve the health of your heart. Well, too much drinking can also damage your heart and increase your chances of having a heart attack or a stroke. 
Around two months after you stop drinking, your heart will have repaired most of the damage caused by overconsumption of alcohol. However, the best thing you can do to increase heart strength is to exercise. By reducing or completely stopping your alcohol consumption and exercising more, your heart can become stronger and healthier. Even though this next change doesn't directly impact your body, something amazing happens when you stop drinking for a few months. Your bank account suddenly starts looking healthier too. Having more money could lead to less stress in your life, which would definitely be beneficial to your health. Research has shown that people who drink socially end up spending between $500 to $1,200 on alcohol annually. But if you live in a more expensive city and enjoy going out for drinks frequently, these numbers can be much higher. People who stopped drinking have noticed that the money they saved was enough for a down payment on a car or to take the vacation they've always wanted to go on. These are clearly positive impacts on your life that may result in less stress and increased happiness. Interestingly, stress has a very similar effect on the body as alcohol does. It can increase blood pressure, cause heart problems, negatively affect your skin, and cause depression. Months after you stop drinking, your body might feel a hundred times better due to a combination of less stress and allowing your organs to repair themselves. One of the most surprising changes to your body after you stop drinking happens without you feeling anything. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has found that alcohol can be a carcinogen. This means that there's a chance the substance can cause cancer. The research suggests that people who consume large amounts of alcohol are at a higher risk for certain types of cancer, which makes sense when you think about it. Since your body technically sees alcohol as a toxin and your liver is responsible for removing that toxin, it's no surprise that people who are heavy drinkers have a high risk of developing liver cancer. Some research also suggests that alcohol can cause an increase of cancer in the esophagus as well. More research needs to be done, but there does seem to be a correlation between heavy alcohol consumption and increased risk of cancer. This means that once you stop drinking, you're actually lowering your chances of your body developing cancer, and this benefit doesn't just persist for a few years, but for the rest of your life. Just to be clear, most doctors and scientists agree that occasionally drinking alcohol poses very minimal health risks. In fact, consuming alcohol in moderation might have some health benefits. However, health problems arise when overconsumption occurs. But to be fair, this is true with almost anything you put into your body. When you stop drinking, your body goes through several changes over time. But even if you only reduce the amount you drink, similar beneficial effects can occur. If you're planning to do something like sober January or want to cut off alcohol for a bit and see how it goes, just know that you will definitely feel better after the initial shock to your system. However, the health effects that come from long-term sobriety probably won't occur in just a single month. If you want to drink from time to time, that's okay. You can still receive some of the benefits mentioned in this video just by limiting your alcohol consumption to one drink or less a day. By reducing alcohol intake, your body can recover and you can live a long and happy life while also having a glass of hooch every now and then. We've all seen countless TV shows where a patient falls into a coma. The weeping family members try everything possible to resuscitate their loved one, from standing by their side and reading them stories to playing their favorite music, all in hopes of breaking through. Unfortunately, comas are medically complicated phenomenon with different causes and effects, and despite all our advances in modern medicine, we remain mostly in the dark about how to successfully treat one. But what exactly happens to your body when you're in a coma? First, we have to be clear that comas are very different from sleep. Despite the fact that the origin of the word comes from the Greek for coma or deep sleep, Comas are not sleep, however, and are instead various forms of unconsciousness that render a person unable to respond to any external stimuli. You can play the loudest, heaviest death metal in the world right next to someone who's comatose, and you won't succeed in doing anything except really annoying the neighbors. Likewise, you can even physically hurt people in a coma, and they will remain completely oblivious and unresponsive. In times in the not-too-distant past, this was sometimes used as treatment, with doctors trying to shock their victims back into consciousness. Everything was tried, from exposing parts of the body to open flames, to severely dropping the body's temperature with ice, to even bloodletting from the head directly. One treatment even included wholly emptying the stomach. We guess because the doctors thought that if a patient got hungry enough, the body would force them to wake up. Or maybe they really were just throwing everything, including the kitchen sink, at the problem, which we're sure was also tried. Comas can occur as a result of serious trauma or as a deliberate medical treatment by doctors. They are typically brought on by traumatic head injury, and it's believed that it's the brain's way of shutting down so it can focus on repairing itself. They can also, however, be brought on by a stroke or a brain tumor, drug or alcohol abuse, or an illness such as diabetes or infection. Most of the time, a coma only lasts a few weeks, though, but past this period, the patient can enter a persistent vegetative state that severely lessens their chance of ever coming back out of one. 
Sometimes people who recover may end up with major or minor disabilities as well, to include speech impediments, mental retardation, or problem coordinating body movements. Medically induced comas, meanwhile, are used when patients are at high risk of brain injury, either due to physical trauma, drug overdoses, or diseases. The purpose is to protect and control the pressure dynamics of the brain, as during injury or disease the brain can swell up and push against the skull, which can starve some parts of the brain of oxygen. A medically induced coma reduces the electrical activity and slows down the brain's metabolism, minimizing swelling and inflammation. There are several different types of comas and they each differ from each other. A vegetative state means that a person's body can make physical movements such as grunts or yawns, but has no reaction to actual stimuli. The movements are purely involuntary and sadly for loved ones seeing the body of someone you care about suddenly yawn can induce false hope. The truth is, the brain remains shut down and operating only at the most basic levels. Catatonia, on the other hand, is a complete lack of any movement or response of any kind. This is exactly as it sounds, and often catatonic patients require help from machines to breathe and possibly even pump the heart. Brain death means that the higher brain functions are completely destroyed, and the brain only carries out autonomic functions such as breathing and swallowing, which are hardwired into our brain's programming. A brain dead person has in effect no chance for recovery, and typically brain death results from extreme physical trauma or severe illness. A stupor is technically not a form of coma, but is sometimes referred to as one. This is a case of one being able to be awakened but only with considerable effort. People in stupor can often fall right back into a deep unconsciousness, but more often than not will recover on their own. The danger is if they dip so deep into unconsciousness that their autonomic functions are impaired. While in a coma your brain shows zero awareness or cognitive processing and is completely unable to respond to outside stimuli, it is in effect as if the brain has been completely turned off or is being rebooted like a computer. Except for in the most severe cases, the body will continue to breathe and the heart will continue to pump, and if you block the airway, patients can even cough as the body attempts to recover airflow. But that's about it, as the brain seems to be unable to communicate through the brainstem and the cerebrum, which controls cognitive consciousness through a process called the reticular activating system. Any doctor will admit that there's a great deal we simply don't know about the coma state. And in 2013, doctors treating an epileptic man in a coma were puzzled to find brain activity in the hippocampus. These ridges on the floor of each lateral ventricle of the brain are thought to be the center for emotion, memory, and the autonomic nervous system, meaning it's quite possible that the unconscious person was experiencing memories but little else. The doctors replicated their findings in cats, which were placed under general anesthetic, and the knowledge they gleamed may help make some comas reversible. While they don't believe that this means a coma patient with this type of mental activity or any other has any sort of awareness or ability to communicate about their condition, it is strong evidence for the fact that the brain does in fact take actions to try and repair or protect itself while in a comatose state. The rest of the body typically remains unaffected by the coma state though, with functions such as breathing and heart beating being so hardwired into our passive nervous system that we do these things literally without thought. People in a coma state though will require IVs which they are fed through and kept hydrated which are intubated with breathing tubes to maintain a clear airway, though some coma patients do retain the reflexes to swallow. The most common issue facing coma patients, though, is muscle atrophy, which comes from simply not using your muscles for prolonged periods of time. You don't need to be in a coma for this to happen, though. If you've ever been a couch potato for a few weeks at a time, then you've likely experienced the severe weakness of muscles that have atrophied from a lack of exercise. Even just getting up for a walk one day can keep your muscles from wasting away. Bed sores are another serious concern for coma patients, also known as pressure ulcers. These are common for people who are bedridden or immobile, or perhaps unable to sense pain. These happen on areas of the skin that are under pressure from lying in bed, sitting down, or wearing a tight cast for a very long time. They develop when the blood supply to the skin is cut off for more than two to three hours, and as the skin dies, the bed sore starts as a red, painful area which will eventually turn purple. If not treated, the skin will split open and the area runs the risk of of infection. They can also become very deep if undetected or untreated, extending into the muscle or even the bone, and they're very slow to heal. Sometimes bed sores can take years to heal and may require surgery. The most common places bed sores form are on the buttocks area, the heels of the feet, 
shoulder blades, back of the head, and backs and sides of the knees. If left untreated, they can grow grotesquely large. If you have the stomach for it, go ahead and do a Google image search for untreated bed sores. We did, and we deeply regret it. The good news about comas is that despite what medical dramas may tell you, most people recover within a few weeks to at least some level of their previous mental capacity. However, new research and techniques is continually improving our knowledge of comas and how to treat them. And in 2017, a 35-year-old man who'd been in a vegetative state since he was 20 was entered into a state doctors call minimal consciousness by stimulating the vagus nerve. This is one of the largest nerves in the body and goes directly to the heart, lungs, upper digestive tract, and other organs. While not awake, doctors were able to have him follow objects with his eyes and even prompted looks of surprise on his face, though sadly he was unable to talk or show any sort of higher brain function. Doctors warned though that while it's a big step forward, it's far from a conclusive one because comas are as radically different from each other as those who suffer them, and what works on one individual may sadly not work on others. You already know the male body has its quirks. You probably even learned some weird facts about it from the infographic show. And now you're back for more. So we did a little more digging and found even weirder facts about the male body. We're about to take things to a whole new level. Obviously, some of the weirdest facts about the male anatomy have to do with the penis, but we're going to steer clear of that area of the body for a little bit. If that's what you were looking forward to, no worries, it'll come later. Let's look at some really weird facts that have to do with the rest of the male body. We're going to start with the eyes. Males are better at tracking moving objects at a distance than females, but did you know that males are not as good at seeing shades of colors as women are? And the reason why is pretty crazy. Men's eyes evolved to be able to hunt animals and make quick decisions in high-stakes situations. This means their ability to track at both a distance and short range needed to be as good as possible. However, seeing different shades of those colors was not quite as important. It didn't matter what the animal's color was, just that a male hunter could track and kill it. Females, on the other hand, had a very different set of skills they needed to be proficient at in early human history. One of these tasks was locating and gathering plants and berries. Yes, there were most likely some women who also hunted, and yes, there were most likely men who also foraged for food. But from what we can see in the archaeological record, it seems hunting of big prey was normally done by males, and gathering of plants was normally done by females. So it was much more important for females to be able to differentiate between various shades of the same color, especially when identifying an edible berry bush or one that was poisonous and would kill you. The slight difference in shades of color between the leaves and the berries could literally mean life or death. Therefore, females evolved to have more sensitive eyes when it came to seeing colors. The biological reason why males cannot see as many shades of color as females most likely has to do with the number and arrangement of cones in the eyes of men. Cones are the receptors that capture light waves and send signals to the brain so you can see in color. There also might be parts of the brain that developed differently between men and women that contribute to this. In particular, men have trouble discerning shades of blue, yellow, and green. It's interesting to note that these are mostly colors found in plants and rarely found on animals that humans hunted earlier in history. In fact, mammals, which include woolly mammoths, deer, and saber-toothed tigers, cannot produce green pigment and therefore, these animals that human males hunted would never have been green. The eyes of males tend to react more to slightly longer wavelengths of light than females. Orange may appear more red to men than it does to women, and green can seem a bit more yellow to males. It's crazy to think that the male and female eye could actually see things differently, and that's just one interesting difference between the two sexes, and sticking with the male face. There's another weird thing about it. When we think of men like Nick Offerman who plays Ron Swanson on Parks and Rec, or Tom Selleck in his glorious mustache, it's easy to forget that facial hair is a pretty unique feature. It is rare that females have facial hair, and even those who do tend to get rid of it, but not men. Instead, they embrace facial hair. And the crazy part is that there are around 15,000 hair follicles on the male face alone. That's not even counting the ones on top of a man's head. Even the most baby-faced men still have no less than 7,000 hair follicles on their face, according to Gillette razors. And those follicles mean that the razor industry generated around $18 billion in 2019. As we go down the male body, we're going to quickly skip over that oh-so-fascinating area just below the waistline and continue to the male's feet. We know feet probably aren't as exciting as the penis for most of you, but others it can be a real fetish. Jokes aside, men tend to have bigger feet than females. Even men and women who are the same height have different sized feet. Male feet are on average longer and wider than female feet. 
Men also have lower arches and longer ankles. This allows them to be slightly more stable at the base of their body. The larger feet allow for more surface area to be in contact with the ground, which in turn provides more stability. Now, I know you're wondering if foot size has any correlation to penis size, and the answer is absolutely not. A study was conducted by two urologists, that is a medical profession that specializes in the urinary system, which measured the feet and penis length of 104 men. They found there was no correlation between shoe size and penis size. For some of you, this is good news. For others, it might be a little disappointing. Our next stop on this tour of the male body is the gums. It's here that we may find a surprising connection between gum disease and the genitalia of men. In both males and females, the American Academy of Periodontology has found that the inflammation from gum disease might be linked to heart disease, diabetes, and even rheumatoid arthritis. It's important to distinguish between correlation and causation, but there does seem to be some kind of connection between gum health and the health of the rest of the body. In males, things go a step further. There have been studies that have connected chronic gum disease to erectile dysfunction in males. So for males, it's extra important to maintain healthy gums, especially if you want your penis to work properly. In a national study in Taiwan, it was found that men with periodontitis, which is a severe gum infection, were more likely to have erectile dysfunction. Again, more studies and research needs to be done, but just to be on the safe side, males should definitely start taking better care of their gums and teeth. Another weird fact about the male body is its susceptibility to hernias. We're now getting really close to the penis. We aren't quite there yet, but after this crazy fact you might not even care anymore. Hernias often occur when an internal organ such as part of the intestines or stomach pushes through a weak spot in the abdominal muscles of the body. Males tend to be more susceptible to one type of hernia called the inguinal hernia than women are. Why is this, you might ask? It's because males have more weak spots near their inguinal ring, which is where the nerves and arteries connect to the testes. These weak spots unfortunately allow the intestines and fats in the area to slip through from time to time creating a hernia. Women also have an inguinal ring, but the weak spots are not as large as the males. Therefore, men tend to be more susceptible to hernias. We finally got to the moment you've been waiting for. It's about to get real weird and crazy in this video, so get ready. First, the good news. If you have a penis, it's about twice as long as you think it is. That's probably really exciting for many of you. Now let's be clear, about half the muscles that make up the penis are inside the body. This is because the sex organ needs to be connected to the rest of your body systems so it can, you know, work. If you were to dissect a human male and take out the entire reproductive system, you would see that about half of the penis is within the body, and when measuring it, the male's entire penis is twice as long as what can be seen just on the outside. Now the bad news. There's a disease that can actually curve a man's penis into the shape of a boomerang. The disease is called Pyrenees disease, and it happens when scar tissue develops on the penis. It causes it to curve, and as a result, erections can be incredibly painful. Some males that have Pyrenees disease only have a slight curve, which means getting an erection is bearable, but as the penis becomes more and more bent, things can get bad. So bad, in fact, that Pyrenees disease can curve the penis to an angle where the male can no longer have sex. And if that wasn't unpleasant enough, the disease can also cause the penis to shorten in length. It's a really terrible illness for the males of the human species. Most of the time, men need to have their penis operated on in order to reverse the condition. The sooner treatment begins, the better in this case. Now let's get real weird. Take a guess when a male can achieve his first erection. And now buckle in, because what we're about to tell you will blow your mind. A male can get his first erection before he is even born. That's right, human males have been recorded to have an erection while still developing in their mother's uterus. It seems to occur when the fetus is experiencing REM sleep. It's also totally not uncommon for the baby to be born with an erection. Imagine being the proud parent of a baby boy and as he's born he has a full-on erection. That would make for an embarrassing first picture when welcoming your baby to the world. No one is entirely sure why a developing fetus or a newborn needs to have an erection, but it may just be the body's way of testing out the equipment to make sure everything's in working order. And if male babies having erections didn't weird you out, this next fact definitely will. We know that males can get an erection as a fetus, baby, and when they're fully grown, but what about when a man dies? Well, you probably guess now where this is going. The death erection, also known as angel's lust, happens after a man passes away. This may just be an involuntary response in some males, but it gets weirder. Death erections have been recorded in the past as most commonly occurring to men who were killed by hanging. Now, we know the guys are into some pretty kinky stuff, and perhaps choking is a turn on for some, but scientists think a death erection by hanging probably has more to do with the noose pressing on the cerebellum at the back of the head than being into BDSM. However, death erections have also been recorded in men who have been killed by gunshot and poisoning, so it may be that human males are just horny, even in death. Our final weird fact about the male body may tickle you a little, literally. 
there's a part of the genitalia in males called the cremaster muscles. These muscles are wrapped around the male's testicles. They're fairly sensitive and have a reflexive reaction similar to when a doctor hits the area just below your kneecap. Normally, these muscles are used to pull the testes closer to the body when things get cold. However, there's another way to get these muscles to react. If the side of a man's upper thigh is stroked in just the right way, the cremaster muscles engage and contract on the same side that's being stroked. This can cause the male's body to unintentionally pull the testes up toward the abdomen until the muscles relax once again. So if you want to see a male body do something pretty weird, try experimenting with the upper part of their thigh. The male anatomy is full of wonders, from large feet to eyes that don't see certain shades of color. A man's body is quite the enigma. Just remember, there is more to men than just their weird genitalia. In the spring of 2009, 72-year-old Prox Sanchez was having trouble hearing and also experiencing earaches. A hearing specialist sent him to get an MRI. Just after the scan started, Prox felt an excruciating pain under his right eye. Meanwhile, the technician stopped the test, saying that they were experiencing interference from the metal in his head. Prox was puzzled. He didn't have any metal in his head, or so he thought. The doctors looked at an older CT scan of Prox's head and were shocked to find something metal the size of a toothpick in the images. While leaving the doctor's office, Prox suddenly coughed up a one-inch nail. The giant magnet in the MRI machine had dislodged a nail that was stuck in Prox's sinus cavity, sending it down his throat. Doctors thought he might have had the nail stuck in his head for 30 years. The doctors also told Prox when he sniffed up the nail, membrane tissue probably formed around it. The nail might have stayed there forever without the MRI. Although Prox did carpentry, he was bewildered as to how he got a nail up his nose without noticing it. Some very odd and disturbing things have been found in the human body, quite often by medical professionals. Before we go any further, let's discuss what this video is not about. Human beings sometimes have unusual, shall we say, inclinations, which can lead to needing medical assistance to remove items from the lower part of their intestinal system. As many medical professionals who work in an emergency room can tell you, some patients seem to have carefully thought out explanations where somehow they accidentally fell on various objects and those items got stuck. They're visiting the hospital for a rectal foreign body removal procedure because they're unable to remove the item on their own. Frankly, we could spend a whole video discussing this topic, but there are many forum discussions and x-ray pictures online that give veracity to such anecdotes. However, we have provided a short list called from the internet of items which have been removed during medical exams or in some cases emergency surgery. Admittedly, most of these items aren't disturbing as of themselves. It's only when you think where they were found the disturbing factor comes into play. Barbie doll, Buzz Lightyear action figure, candle, candy cane, carrot, cell phone, champagne flute, cucumber, egg, eggplant, flashlight, fork, golf ball, impulse body spray perfume glass bottle, jar of instant coffee, jar of peanut butter, key, knife, light bulb, long necked glass soda bottle, orange, pen, pepper shaker, ping pong ball, pint glass, plastic bowling pin, potato, salad tongs, salt shaker, screwdriver, shot glass, toothbrush, toy car, turnip, wine cork, zucchini. <laughs> Now that we've settled that, who feels like sushi? In February of 2012, the Journal of Parasitology published a report on a 63-year-old Korean woman who experienced severe needle-like pain in her mouth while eating a dish of parboiled squid. She immediately spat the squid out, but it was too late. Upon examination by a doctor, 12 squid spermatophores were found to have implanted themselves into the mucous membrane of the woman's tongue, cheek, and gingiva. The parasites were promptly removed along with some of the woman's damaged oral tissues. Apparently, internal organs, including the sperm bag, weren't removed from the squid before meal preparation. A game played by some kids in India almost had deadly consequences for one of the players. In 2012, 12-year-old 12 Anil Barela of Madhya Pradesh was messing around with some friends at a local river. The kids dared one another to swallow live fish. Anil took on the challenge. However, instead of going down Anil's esophagus, the three-and-a-half-inch fish slipped down his windpipe and entered his left lung. Anil began to have trouble breathing and was rushed to the local hospital. The doctors measured the oxygen level in Anil's blood at 80%, 18 points lower than a normal 98%. An x-ray showed Anil's left lung as completely opaque due to the foreign object lodged in it. Doctors performed an emergency bronchoscopy and inserted a cable into Anil's lungs. The camera showed that the fish was still alive. 
Doctors then performed a 45-minute procedure to remove the fish. Anil made a full recovery. Planning on sticking to vegetables now? In another food-related mishap in the summer of 2010, 75-year-old retired school teacher Ron Svenden felt terrible. He was chronically fatigued, had lost his appetite, and frequently had coughing spells. A lifelong smoker, Ron had been battling emphysema for some time, but with the sudden turn in his health, he worried that he had cancer. When Ron was rushed to the hospital with a collapsed lung, his x-rays revealed something unusual. There was a one and a half inch pea sprout growing in his lung. Much like Anil, doctors thought that while eating peas, one simply went down the wrong pipe and lodged in Ron's lung instead of ending up in his stomach. Ron was relieved to find out that he didn't have cancer and was also amazed. He couldn't remember the last time he had eaten fresh peas either. Apparently, when a pea germinates, it simply needs a warm, wet place to begin to sprout. The pea shoot was removed from Ron's lung by a thoracic surgeon. As a joke, the hospital staff served Ron peas as part of his first meal after the operation. Ron took the joke in stride and ate them. Ron's not the only person to have a plant grow in their lungs. In 2009, Russian doctors operated on 28-year-old Artyom Sidorkin, expecting to remove a tumor and allegedly found a 2-inch fur seedling sprouting in his lung. Obviously, the results of ingesting non-food items can be very dangerous. 52-year-old Margaret Dahlman of the Netherlands showed up at the hospital complaining of a stomach ache. Upon viewing x-rays of her stomach, doctors were dumbfounded to see a large mass of silverware. When going in for surgery, Margaret explained to the doctors that often when she sat down to eat, she couldn't help herself. She would ignore the meal and feast on the cutlery instead. Margaret had previously been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, which left her with an urge to eat non-food items. The surgery removed 78 spoons and forks from Margaret's stomach. However, no knives were found. Margaret was never interested in eating those, and she couldn't explain why. Margaret made a full recovery and underwent therapy for her predilection. Margaret's not the only one to suffer this strange affliction, though. Doctors have removed a variety of items that patients have ingested. Common non-food snacks are magnets, coin, and chalk. In 2014, a teenage girl from Kyrgyzstan's bad habit almost ended her life. Though her stomach was swollen, 18-year-old Aperi Alexeva kept losing weight and was dangerously dehydrated and malnourished. She couldn't keep any food down, even just drinking water brought about terrible pains. Doctors struggled to diagnose her at first and then figured out the culprit. A massive hairball was blocking her digestive system. Aperi had to be transported to a large hospital in the capital city of Bishkek for an emergency life-saving surgery to remove the 9-pound hairball. The hairball formed due to Perry's proclivity to chew on and eat her hair and bits and pieces of wool she found on the carpet at home. Apparently, during her surgery, her stomach was so distended, hair began to ooze out as soon as the wall of Perry's stomach was cut. Despite looking through 50 years of records, the doctor said they were unable to find any cases that involved a hairball this large. You heard correctly, not other cases involving a hairball, other cases involving a hairball this large. Sometimes after a vacation, you end up feeling more stressed than if you had just stayed at work. In the summer of 2007, Aaron Dallas of Carbondale, Colorado, visited the town of Orange Walk, Belize to assist with a mountain bike race. Upon returning home, he developed large, painful bumps on his head that bled and oozed. His doctor thought they were fly bites that would eventually heal up. But the bumps wouldn't heal. Aaron visited a specialist who thought he might have shingles, a painful rash caused by the varicella zoster virus, the same virus that causes chickenpox. Aaron tried several different creams and ointments, but to no avail. Weeks went by. Aaron started getting flashes of pain that would send him to his knees. It felt like spikes were being driven into his skull. Then the lumps started throbbing and moving. Aaron thought he was going crazy. He could even hear the lumps. Another visit to a doctor brought about the revelation that Aaron's scalp was infested with botfly larvae. Medical staff numbed Aaron's head and extracted five fingernail-sized maggots. Most likely, Aaron was bitten by a mosquito carrying botfly eggs. Mosquitoes, stable flies, and other insects are used by female botflies to disseminate their eggs to various hosts. In this case, the host was Aaron. Aaron's not the only person who's brought home an unexpected souvenir after a vacation. During the summer of 2013, the Franklin family of Aliso Viejo, California went on a camping trip to Spooner's Cove Beach on the central Californian coast. Four-year-old Paul fell and scraped his right knee on a rock. His parents cleaned up the small cut and put a band-aid on it. However, the wound kept seeping and never seemed to scab over. A week later, Paul fell on the knee again while ice skating further opening the wound. His mother once again cleaned and redressed the cut. Over the next few weeks, Paul's knee became swollen and infected. He began to limp, 
thinking he had a staph infection, his parents took him to the doctor. At first, a 10-day course of antibiotics seemed to improve the infection, but then it flared up again. The cut began seeping pus and a small black lump grew under Paul's skin. His mother worried that the wound was becoming necrotic. Against the doctor's advice, she squeezed the lump, and an odd-looking tiny rock popped out of Paul's knee. His mother took a closer look at the pebble, noticing a swirl pattern. She realized it was a tiny snail, and it was alive. The Franklins figured that there were snail eggs on the rock Paul scraped his knee on. Paul's parents let him keep the snail as a pet and he named it Turbo, after the cartoon snail. We could go on and on about the various insects, larvae, tapeworms, and spiders that have been discovered and removed from people. Ears and nose seem to be especially popular hiding places, perhaps because of the easy access. However, we'll spare you and leave it to your imagination. In 2015, Estela Melendez, a 91-year-old resident of La Boca, Chile, went to the hospital after a fall. She had an x-ray and was told by doctors she had a tumor in her abdomen and needed surgery. A second x-ray was ordered for confirmation and it revealed something shocking. The mass was not a tumor, but a fetus. For the last 60 years, Estella had a lump in her abdomen but didn't know that she was carrying a lithopedion, or stone baby. It's a rare phenomenon that occurs when a fetus dies during pregnancy and is too large to be reabsorbed by the mother. As part of a foreign body reaction, the fetus calcifies on the outside, protecting the mother's body from dead tissue and preventing infection. There have been about 300 cases of known lithopedion worldwide with the calcified fetus being carried for an average of 22 years. In several cases, the mother was able to become pregnant again and gave birth to children without incident. In the case of Estella, the mass was only sometimes uncomfortable, but not causing serious pain. Medical professionals decided not to proceed with surgery. However, sometimes doctors do remove a lithopedion. In 2009, 92-year-old Huang Yijun from China had a 60-year-old fetus removed. In 1948, when she was 31, she became pregnant only to find that she had a rare condition. Instead of implanting in the uterus as normal, her pregnancy was ectopic, with the egg implanting outside her fallopian tubes, causing what's known as an abdominal pregnancy. The fetus soon passed away and doctors told Huang Yijun to get it removed to avoid any potential future health problems. Unfortunately, the surgery was expensive and Huang simply didn't have the money. So she ignored her condition until she was able to have it removed some 60 years later. Our last story of something disturbing removed from a person's body is about an interesting and creepy medical phenomenon which is estimated to occur in 1 in 500,000 live births. All his life, Sanju Bhagat of Nagpur, India had breathing problems and a protruding belly. Over time, his stomach swelled even further, making him look like he was nine months pregnant. One night in June of 1999, his breathing problems got worse and an ambulance rushed the 36-year-old farmer to the hospital. Doctors began to operate, thinking that Sanju had a large tumor pressing on his diaphragm. As they cut into Sanju's stomach, unexpectedly gallons of liquid gushed out. Then the doctors found something unsettling. Sanju had a twin. In his stomach, there was a half-formed fetus with hair, bones, and developed hands with long fingernails. Sanju had one of the world's rarest and most bizarre medical conditions, fetus and fetu. It's an extremely rare development abnormality that occurs early in pregnancy when a fetus gets trapped inside its twin. The parasitic twin leeches off the dominant twin as the fetuses continue to grow. Usually, both fetuses die before birth from the strain of sharing a placenta. However, in some cases such as Sanju's, the host twin survives and is born. It is possible for the trapped fetus to survive past birth by forming an umbilical cord-like structure that leeches its twin's blood supply. Fewer than 90 cases of fetus and fetu have been recorded in medical literature though. Sanju's case is even more unusual because no one suspected Bagat had a twin inside him for 36 years. After surgery, Sanju's ability to breathe improved and he made a full recovery. As a kid, Sanju had been bullied and teased that he was pregnant. Ironically, his tormentors were sort of right. The female body is full of mysteries. From having a self-cleaning reproductive system to using more of the brain when making decisions, women have men beat in a number of unique ways. You're about to learn things that will amaze you, shock you, and gross you out. Number 50. On average, men might be stronger than women, but female muscles are definitely more resilient. Research has shown that muscles in the female body not only stay stronger for longer compared to men, but they can also recover from damage more rapidly. Women also don't tire quite as fast as men, meaning that they can go harder for longer. Basically, the female body evolved to be a high-endurance machine capable of doing incredible things. Number 49. Not only do women's muscles last longer than males, but they tend to live longer as well. 
This is because their bodies are built to withstand extreme trauma from childbirth and protecting their young. On average, women live between 5 to 6 years longer than men. Some scientists think this is because they take better care of their bodies and typically choose healthier lifestyles. However, women have also evolved to be extremely tough, as a large number of healthy, strong females is vital to the survival of the species. But lifestyle isn't the only factor that contributes to female longevity. There is something even crazier about the female body that gives them a higher life expectancy. Number 48. The female immune system is a force to be reckoned with. Studies show that the female immune system is more powerful than their male equivalent. One reason for this might be because they need to protect a developing fetus for 9 months before giving birth. Having a strong immune system that's able to destroy pathogens before they can harm the baby is essential, although females have a higher rate of autoimmune diseases, which might also be linked to their active immune systems. There is a surprising way that females can boost their immune system even more, and it has to do with sex. Number 47. Recent studies have found that female immune systems can increase in efficiency if they have more sex. It was uncovered that women who have sex two to three times a week have 30% more IgA antibodies in their blood than people who did not have sex. IgA antibodies are one of the first lines of defense against foreign invaders and can be found in the mucus lining of the nose and airways. So, sex can give additional protection to the body, meaning the carnal act has other benefits besides just feeling good. And speaking of sex, the female body has an organ that's sole function is to provide pleasure. Number 46. The clitoris has one purpose and one purpose only, to provide the female with sexual satisfaction. There is no other organ in males or females that can claim the honor of only functioning as a pleasure center. Number 45. The clitoris and penis are analogous structures. This is not super surprising when you think about it, since we all start off as a single cell and then develop more or less in the same way. However, if a fetus contains the instructions to become female, the genitalia cells will differentiate into a clitoris. Conversely, those same cells will become a penis if the fetus is programmed to become a male. Now, we're going to stick with the clitoris for a little while as it's an incredible organ. Number 44. The clitoris continues to grow throughout a female's life. By the time a woman reaches menopause, her clitoris is around three to four times larger than when she started puberty. This is fascinating because since the clitoris is responsible for pleasure, some scientists have hypothesized that a larger clitoris might play a role in more orgasms or at least more sexual satisfaction in mature women. The thought is that the larger the clitoris, the easier it is to stimulate. Number 43. And speaking of stimulation, around 75% of women report that it is the stimulation of the clitoris that makes them orgasm, not the intercourse itself. Let's step away from the female reproductive system for the moment and focus on another pleasure center of the body. Number 42. Some women have reported that they're able to achieve orgasms just from the stimulation of their nipples. A study published in the Journal of Sexual Medicine found that when the nipples are played with, the genital sensory cortex part of the brain becomes excited. This is the same region of the brain that's known to become active when a female is sexually satisfied through the clitoris or vagina. The research suggests that the nipples should not be neglected during sexy time as they can provide women with a significant amount of pleasure. Number 41. What's even crazier is that the part of the brain which is aroused during sex and sexual stimulation can also be aroused when a female thinks about food. This is especially true when they have cravings connected to their menstrual cycles or pregnancy. It's funny to think about how the stimulation a partner gives a female can be replaced with some chocolate or a juicy steak. It begs the question if women really need men at all. Number 40. One breast is always larger than the other. Normally, the size difference is barely noticeable, but every female has a slight difference in size between their two boobs. There doesn't seem to be a pattern into which breast is bigger, but on average, the left breast usually is larger than the right. The size discrepancy varies from female to female, but it's improbable that a female will have two breasts of identical size and shape. What makes someone biologically female? The answer to this question may be more complicated than you realize. Number 39. A main indicator of whether someone is biologically female is their sex chromosomes. There are two different sex chromosomes, X and Y. Females have two X chromosomes, while males have an X and a Y chromosome. However, it's possible for a female to also have an X and a Y chromosome. When a sperm fertilizes an egg, half of the resulting cell's chromosomes come from a mom and half from the dad. If dad passes on a Y chromosome, the baby will be biologically male unless there is a missing section of the transferred Y chromosome, known as the SRY gene. This is the portion of the DNA responsible for developing male traits such as the penis. If the SRY gene is missing or damaged on the Y chromosome, the cells will revert to their default setting creating a female. When the SRY gene is turned off, testosterone is not released and the amount needed to cause the cells to differentiate into a male body. This makes it possible for a female to have XY sex chromosomes. Circadian rhythms are what help our bodies regulate its day-to-day -day processes, but the female body has a surprisingly long cycle. 
Number 38. Women tend to go to bed and wake up earlier than men. There's a biological reason for this. The female circadian rhythm tends to be slightly faster than males. The biological day for a female is around 6 minutes shorter than for males, which is why they tend to go to sleep and wake up earlier. There doesn't seem to be much benefit to this, but it might explain why more women report having insomnia than men. Over time, this discrepancy between a female's inner clock and the 24-hour day can really start to affect them negatively. Some women who have circadian rhythms that run extra fast struggle to stay awake and focus throughout the day because their body is telling them to go to sleep even if the sun is up. This can also lead to restless nights and sleep deprivation. There's no doubt women are strong, yet they cry more often than males do. This is not because they are more emotional but because of the size of their tear ducts. Number 37. Adult women cry about five times more a month than men do. Women's tear glands are actually anatomically different than men's. They tend to be larger and have a different biochemical makeup, which leads to females crying more often than males. Also, women produce around 50% more prolactin in their bodies than males do, which is a hormone that regulates lactation. This molecule also plays a role in the production of tears. It is the higher levels of prolactin and the biological differences in their tear ducts that are probably responsible for females crying more often than males. Not that they're more emotional. In fact, many studies suggest females are more level-headed than men and are able to cope with emotional stress better. The vagina is a surprisingly hostile place, yet there are creatures living in there even though it's acidic. Number 36. The pH level in the vagina is around 4.5, which makes the vaginal environment around the same acidity as wine and coffee. This is not the ideal environment for many creatures, which is one of the defense mechanisms the vagina has against foreign invaders. However, there are a plethora of microbes that call the vagina home. Number 35. A group of acid-producing bacteria called lactobacillus find the vagina a great place to live. In fact, they even help maintain high levels of acidity so they can thrive. This in turn keeps other bacteria that can cause yeast and other types of infections away. Without a vaginal microbiome, a female's reproductive system would be much more prone to diseases caused by harmful pathogens. Number 34. The female reproductive system isn't just damaging to pathogens, it can also make the sperm's job very difficult. Almost every single sperm out of the millions ejaculated into a female during intercourse die before reaching the egg. This is why getting pregnant for some women can be so difficult. Sperm are hardy and can last up to 5 days in the female reproductive system, but more often than not, the hostile environment inside the female's reproductive tract kills them within hours. There are other creepy creatures that the female body seems to have an adverse effect to besides microbes and sperm. Number 33. Researchers at Carnegie Mellon University conducted a study where they gauged the reactions of human babies when they were shown pictures of a human face versus a spider. What they found was that female babies spent more time looking at human faces than spiders. Males, on the other hand, spent about the same time looking at both. This might suggest that the female brain has evolved a natural awareness that those creatures can be harmful and should be kept away from. This is evolutionarily beneficial as females are much more vital to the continuation of the species than males are. If a male gets bit by a poisonous spider, he can still provide sperm even as he's dying. If a female gets bit by a poisonous spider while pregnant, it could harm the offspring. Number 32. Unfortunately for females, they are much more likely to suffer than males. This is because the pain that females feel is more intense. Scientists aren't sure why this is, but it might have to do with hormones in the female body. It's been hypothesized that estrogen can dampen the body's painkiller signals, which then amplifies the pain itself. This could explain why females feel more severe pain even if the affliction is the same for both sexes. Pain can even be amplified further by the female body in this next situation. Number 31. Women need to plan ahead when looking into getting a root canal, otherwise their bodies could turn against them. Estrogen not only dampens painkiller signals, but it can cause dry sockets in the mouth when there are high amounts of the hormone in the body. If a dry socket becomes infected, it's reported to be one of the most painful experiences of someone's life. One way to avoid this catastrophe is to schedule dental work when the estrogen levels are lowest in the body. This is typically in the last week of the menstrual cycle. Number 30. What do human females and sharks have in common? They both produce a compound called squalene. In females, this molecule helps keep the vagina lubricated. In sharks, squalene is found in the liver. Although human females produce the same compound, we use shark squalene in moisturizers and skin creams. It acts as an emollient, which moistens the skin. This isn't surprising as it does the same thing for the vagina. Surprisingly, scientists at the American Cancer Society have found that the squalene from sharks can also help reduce the effects of chemotherapy on normal human cells. It does this without inhibiting the chemotherapy drug's effect on the cancerous cells. Scientists aren't quite sure why this is, but more research is being done. Number 29. 
Sometimes women find that hair is clogging the shower drain. This isn't surprising as their pubic hair only lasts around three weeks before falling out. When compared to the life cycle of hair on the head, this is an incredibly short amount of time. So when cleaning the drain, there's a good chance that some of that hair being pulled out is from the pubic region. Men can typically drink more alcohol than women. We're not sure that that's something to be proud of, but the reason why has surprisingly little to do with body type. Number 28. Most females can't drink as much as males of a similar size because they produce less of the necessary stomach enzymes used to break down ethanol. This leads to higher intoxication levels as more and more ethanol gets into the bloodstream and circulates around the body. The result is that females tend to get drunker quicker than most males do. Another downside to drinking alcohol as a female is that hangovers can be worse than for males. This is because the female body contains lower percentage of water than the opposite sex which causes worse dehydration, nausea, and headaches after drinking too much alcohol. Number 27. It may sound crazy, but some females are born with not just one but two uteruses. As the fetus develops, the uterus starts as two separate tubes. Over time, they join together to create one large organ. However, sometimes a condition called uterus didelphus occurs and a female is born with two separate uterus. In unique circumstances, a second vagina might form as well. This creates a forked path within the body to the uteruses. Number 26. The uterus is an amazing organ. It's incredibly elastic as it needs to stretch out a lot during pregnancy. How much does it stretch, you might be wondering? Normally, the uterus is only around 4 to 5 inches long. However, during gestation, it can grow many times that size. In fact, the uterus can extend all the way up to the belly button around 20 weeks into pregnancy. The midsection of a female is full of tightly packed organs. This is exacerbated by the fact that there is a part of the digestive tract which is extra long in their bodies. Number 25. The female body probably didn't need to have anything else crammed into its midsection, but part of the colon called the sigmoid is longer in women than men. This is the end of the large intestine where fecal matter is stored until the waste is ready to leave the body. Theoretically, this means that if a female held in their bowel movement, which we definitely don't recommend, they could have larger poops than a man. Number 24. Everyone poops, even females. Number 23. Having all of the reproductive organs and the extra portion of the sigmoid in the midsection means that there's not much room for expansion. Everything is squeezed into such a small space that the female body digests food and gas builds up. It can cause abdominal distress. This is just a fancy way of saying that females get more frequent stomach aches and release more gas after eating due to the limited space for expansion. There is one fascinating fact about the female reproductive organ that seems almost unbelievable. Number 22. Females are born with all of the eggs they will ever have already in their ovaries. Around 6 to 7 million oocytes or unformed eggs are created during development. But when a female baby is born, she normally ends up with closer to 1.2 million eggs in her ovaries. As she ages, more and more eggs are destroyed and their remnants are absorbed back into the body. By the time a female reaches puberty, she has around 400,000 eggs. Then when menopause occurs, there are about 1,000 eggs left in her ovaries. The menstrual cycle occurs when an egg leaves the ovary and is not fertilized. When this happens, there's bleeding, but not as much as you might think. Number 21. Everyone's body is different. Some females lose more blood than others during their menstrual cycle. However, on average, women lose around 4 tablespoons each month due to their period. It's important to note that some females bleed a lot more than that, as they might have a heavier flow. Number 20. A female's period does not just cause pain in the midsection, but can actually mess with the brain as well. The pain associated with the menstrual cycle causes the brain to lose focus. Research has shown that this can hinder a female's ability to do complex tasks while the body is trying to mitigate the pain from cramps and the shedding of the uterine lining. But worry not, even when a female's brain is distracted, they still have a leg up on men. Number 19. In studies conducted around memory and the ability to retain information, women between the ages of 45 and 55 perform better in almost every category. Even more impressive is this study was conducted while the females were going through menopause, which is known to negatively affect memory recall. Yet, women still remember things better than men, who had no biological excuse for their low scores. This means that throughout a female's life, she will likely be able to recall and remember things much better than the males around her. Number 18. Females have a strong connection between the two hemispheres of their brain. When given a difficult task to solve, research has shown that women use many parts of their brain simultaneously rather than just sticking to one portion. Men, on the other hand, over-engage a single section of their brain. This means that women might combine both logic and intuition when problem-solving, allowing them to think up better solutions more quickly than the opposite sex. Number 17. There is no denying that women are better multitaskers than men. A possible reason for this was published in the Journal of Neuroscience. The section of the brain called the corpus callosum makes sure that both hemispheres are communicating with one another. 
the female Corpus Colossum is larger than the males, which is theorized to be one of the main reasons why women can multitask with such high efficiency. Females have some unique abilities when it comes to their senses. It's often said that women are much more perceptive than men, and there's a biological reason for this. Number 16. The gene that allows people to see the color red is only found on the X chromosome. This means that unlike males, females have two of these genes. The researchers have found that a combination of a normal gene for seeing red and a mutated one allows females to see a broader spectrum of red-orange colors than males. The fact that males only have one copy of this gene also explains why more men are red colorblind than women. Females are also better at differentiating color hues in the yellow-green spectrum, which means they literally see the world differently than men do. Number 15. Both women and men have the same ability to sense smells. However, women can learn to detect a particular scent much better than men can. This ability develops during a woman's childbearing years, and research at Monell Chemical Census Center in Philadelphia has shown that women can smell certain aromas at one one-thousandth of their original concentration. This likely has to do with hormones that are present in the body, somehow making the olfactory neurons more sensitive. Might sound crazy, but females can even sense when their partner is stressed just by smelling the body odor of their shirt. And this isn't the only sense that females have the upper hand in. Number 14. Females have more taste buds on their tongues than males. This means that they have the ability to taste more flavors that might be hidden in food than men. It's also hypothesized that extra taste buds give females more sensitive, sophisticated palates. Number 13. Women can experience multiple orgasms during sex. Once a male's orgasm, he has to wait for his refractory period to end before he can climax again. Females don't have this problem, they can just keep going and going. And this brings us to a mysterious part of the female reproductive system, the G-spot. Number 12. There's a belief that a magical portion of the female sex organ can cause an incredibly intense and pleasurable orgasm when stimulated. This has become known as the G-spot. The original name for this region was the Grafenberg Zone, named after Ernst Grafenberg, the German physician who proposed the area existed. As of yet, there has been no actual proof that a G-spot exists. The best guess of what the G-spot could be as of right now is that it's an internal extension of the clitoris. However, many doctors doubt it exists at all. Another myth of the female body that needs to be debunked also has to do with sex, or the lack thereof. Number 11. For centuries and even today, many people believe that the hymen needs to be intact for a female to be considered a virgin. This is absolutely not true. The hymen is a thin layer of tissue that's located just inside the vagina. It's flexible but not very strong, meaning that physical activities such as biking, horseback riding, or even inserting a tampon can stretch or tear the hymen. Just because a female's hymen is broken does not mean she's had sex. Although this next female fact might seem messy, it's actually part of the natural cleaning process. Number 10. The female reproductive system will sometimes release discharge without warning. This can stain underwear, but it's a natural process the body needs to make sure the vagina remains clean and infection-free. Number 9. The vagina is full of folds and rugi, which are a series of ridges created by the folding of tissue. The reason that the female body needs to create discharge and why it's so important for the vagina to remain clean is because microbes can find refuge in these folds. The ridges are caused by an increase in estrogen that thickens the vaginal tissue. After menopause or while a woman is nursing a newborn, she produces less estrogen, and this causes the folds to flatten out and the entire vagina to become thinner and drier. Number 8. The reduction of estrogen in the female body might result in women in the later stages of life experiencing discomfort during sex. Luckily, with a little bit of lube and patience, the side effects that low estrogen levels have on the vagina can be mitigated during sexual intercourse. Number 7. Women lose collagen at a faster rate than men do. This can lead to more wrinkles in the skin. However, numerous studies have shown that even though men retain more collagen, they look older than women of the same age. This is likely because men tend not to take care of their skin and their body as well as females do. The other reason for this has to do with skin thickness. Number 6. Women's skin is thinner than men's skin on average. This means that the female body shows fewer facial lines and aging spots. It might also account for why some women feel colder than men do, even while the temperature around them is the same. Are females actually more flexible than males? And if so, why? Number 5. The female body contains more elastin than the male body. Elastin is a protein that allows connective tissues to stretch. The fact that the female body contains more of this protein means that they are indeed more flexible than men. On top of that, females tend to have a wider pelvis that gives them a more extensive range of motion. What time of year do women crave sex more? Number 4. Surprisingly, the answer to this question isn't wintertime when it's cold. 
and you're stuck inside. Instead, investigations have found that women actually crave sex more during the summer. Researchers think the reason for this is because of the scents that are present during this time of year. As discussed earlier, females have a strong sense of smell and are able to recall scents better than men. It's not exactly known which smells trigger the female drive of sex, but whatever they are, they appear to be more plentiful in the summer. Another factor that might explain this phenomenon is that sunlight helps activate serotonin in the body, which is a key neurotransmitter that allows humans to experience pleasure. Therefore, if the summer sun causes the female body to want to be pleased, it might cause them to seek out one of the more gratifying experiences in life. Number 3. Regardless of the time of year, women are better at identifying sexual intentions than men are. Both sexes tend to miss cues of sexually interested individuals from time to time, but women are much better at identifying the difference between a friendly interaction and one that has other connotations. This means that in the game of finding a mate, females will likely have much more success than males as they will miss fewer opportunities. And if that last fact got your heart racing, it's nothing compared to our next insane fact about the female body. Number 2. The female heart beats faster than a male heart. This is because a female heart tends to be smaller even when compared to similar body size. To make up for the smaller dimensions, female hearts beat more frequently to ensure enough blood is circulated around the body. The average male heart beats around 70 to 72 beats per minute, while the female heart beats around 78 to 82 beats per minute. Number 1. Females don't need males or their sperm to reproduce anymore. Using in vitro fertilization and other assistive pregnancy methods, two females can combine their genetic information and have a baby. However, two sperm will never be able to be combined to create a viable offspring since an egg is essential for an embryo to form. This means that females might not have any use for males in the future. Now watch Lady Death, world's deadliest female sniper, or check out Female vs. Male Prison. How do they compare?